right, test one, two, test one, two. It just, it worked. Okay. Yeah.
right, good morning and welcome. My name is uh, Alain Philippe Durand, AP Durand. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities at the University of uh, Arizona. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome all of you for this very exciting event uh, that we have for the next two days, uh, this morning and uh, tomorrow morning, same place. So we look forward to, uh, to having you for this uh, series on humanities innovators in a tech world. And uh, just a few things uh, about this series, and I'll say more uh, throughout the morning in between the different, um, the different uh, speakers. Uh, this is the idea about uh, the role, the important role that the humanities, being the College of Humanities, we are asking this question on the important role that the humanities are playing and are going to play increasingly in this new uh, society of art tech and, and new technologies. What is the role of the humanities in this uh, context? And this is uh, uh, something that we are going to hear a lot about um, to today and tomorrow morning. I would like to thank the uh, fantastic speakers that we have with us. For the I think you're really going to enjoy that. Uh, we have fantastic speakers, and I really want to thank them again for taking the time to come to Tucson and to uh, to be with us. I also want to thank our team, the external relations team and our IT uh, team in the college. Uh, this is a lot of work for the logistics. We are live. Uh, this event is being uh, uh, streamed and it will be recorded. So if some of you uh, are not able to stay for the, the entire morning or if you cannot be back tomorrow, for instance, you can still uh, watch the, the streaming or, or, or catch the, uh, the speakers. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So we are going to start. What uh, what we are going to be uh, doing is that um, each speaker will present for about more or less 45 minutes, and then we will get after each presentation an opportunity for you uh, to ask any question. We'll have a Q&A for about 15 minutes, and then move on to the to the next uh, to the next speaker. Uh, so it's my. Uh, uh Honor to introduce uh, the first uh, uh, speaker this morning, uh, Kevin Einlein. is an enthusiastic astronomer <laughs> and postdoctoral researcher working on the James Webb Space Telescope near CAM science team at the University of Arizona Steward Observatory. From 2012 to 2015, he was a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Ryan Ecox at the Dartmouth Department of Physics and Astronomy. His interests lie in the relationship between active galactic nuclei <laughs> and star-forming galaxies, exploring how a central supermassive black hole grows and affects its host galaxy. He did his graduate research at uh, UCLA. The title of his presentation today is Why We Study the Universe from the Big Bang to You. Is this working? There we go. Ah, there's the talk title. Ba -ba. <laughs> uh, thank you, AP, uh, especially for thanking me uh, and us for coming from so far. I came from five minutes away on a bike where I live to my office two minutes north of here. And then I walked here. I knocked on my boss's door and said, I'm going to go give this talk. And she says, oh, have a fun time. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for uh, inviting me to this, uh, the first Dorrance lecture series as the first speaker. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and to be able to talk with both the scholars and the community that's here. This is really exciting for me. Uh, I absolutely love talking about what I do, and I'm very lucky because I work on the coolest thing. I work on astronomy. I'm a black hole hunter. I'm a galaxy finder, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about something that is very important, which is how can we study and understand and think about astronomy uh, as human beings, like we are these, these tiny humans in the face of the vast insane universe. And so that's what I'm going to try and bridge today. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit what I do uh, throughout. And so I'll hopefully get you excited about the thing that I do, which is a super awesome thing in conjunction with NASA. And then uh, at the end, w if you have questions, you, you should ask me. Uh, I, uh, I love talking about this, but I also love talking about the way that I got to my job. And so if you find me in a hallway or if we are having uh, some snacks later on or something like that, please ask me about the weird journey that I took to get to where I am right now. Um, so this talk starts with this. So, so who, especially if you're in the front, what is this? People in the community who know this and are being very smug, just be quiet for a second. What is this thing right here, especially in the first couple rows? It, it's, it's a satellite of sorts. 
I will give you a hint. It's the Blank Space Telescope. It rhymes with rubble. <laughs> I heard someone say it. It's the Hubble Space Telescope. This is NASA's most important space telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope, it was launched in 1990, which means it's probably older than some of the people in this audience, which is insane. Uh, it is. Um, it is a telescope that's been up for almost 30 years orbiting our planet, which is why you see our planet uh, below. Uh, and it is um, this incredible eye that uh, NASA built and put up there that has been an amazing boon for us astronomers. It has opened up a window to the universe, a high resolution imaging window to the universe that has changed astronomy entirely. And for many people, their for, for us astronomers, our interaction with Hubble is through its, its incredible data, deep data sets uh, on a variety of topics. But for many people, the way that they know about Hubble is through the images, these incredibly beautiful images that, like, for, for us astronomers, give a, a, a huge amount of information about what's going on. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing baby stars being born in a, in a little stellar nursery. And Hubble took these images. This is star birth here, right? This is also, someone might look at this and go, I think I have that on my yoga pants. Like, this is a very pretty image that is strong. And like, that's an important aspect of what we do as astronomers, is produce pretty images. Because you would put this on there, because this is gorgeous, the colors and the shapes. And like, for an astronomer, we, we might look at this in a very cold way, but I, I want to argue through this talk, and spoiler alert, this is kind of my argument, that we should be viewing astronomy through an aesthetic sense. That we should view astronomy with our heart, not just our rational cold brain, because otherwise we're losing a huge aspect of it. Uh, Hubble also took images, this is a zoom in of, of like, baby stars are being born in these columns. These, you can see the light that's, that's coming from other stars blowing the gas away, but this is essentially a stellar nursery, what I said. This, astronomers can look at this and tell you about how stars are born, all right? Also, how stars die. This is the remnants of an exploded star. This is what happens when a star blows up in a big gas cloud. It just blows a big hole in the middle, right? So this is, this is another Hubble image, or, or this incredible Hubble image of a, of a galaxy a spiral galaxy, and you can just see all of this stuff. So, so Hubble was, and is, this amazing thing that for maybe the first time, really, it took astronomy and put it into the eyes of the populace. And there were other astronomy pictures, and, and you know, we had spacecraft that went to, to other planets and took these pictures, but I think that Hubble did it in a way that had never been done before. And I think that it's underappreciated how important that was, both as a thing to inspire, this thing was launched when I was young, and uh, I, I looked at these images and felt something stir inside of me that drove me to astronomy. And I think that that is something that we need to remember is vital for this field and for all of astronomy and for the sciences, is, is how we present science to the public. Because sometimes, as a scientist, you can think about, I'm only doing science for myself right? or for my colleagues or for the people who read my papers. But that is not how you should view science. You should view science as a thing that you are doing as a gift and as a, as, a, as a product for the world. You're pushing science forward even little ways, and Hubble pushed it forward in incredible ways. The amount of information held in this and the amount of beauty, that, like, you know, is, 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 like, you can't count it. And the reason that I'm here at the University of Arizona is because Hubble's 30 years old, and NASA, for the last, like, 20 to 30 years since it launched, has been planning a next generation of space telescopes, the next generation, and, and Hubble, uh, has been supplemented with a lot of other telescopes at other wavelengths in space that are doing a really amazing job. But they wanted to make a next generation space telescope that was bigger and more robust and answered bigger questions. And so here is a, um, here's, here's like what it looks, it's about the size of a school bus Hubble. Here's a person next to its mirror. So, you know, the mirror would just kind of sit right here. Um, I'm about to show you an image of the telescope that I work on, and I want to prompt you because people don't need to be prompted with this. Um, when a telescope is bigger, it is better. So the bigger this is, the more of an ooh I want you to give me, okay? So are you ready? So this is the telescope I'm working on. Ooh, oh, yeah, wow, it's incredible. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. The mirror would barely fit in this room, right? It's 6.5 meters across, like 25 to 30 feet across. It's enormous. The telescope is the size of a tennis court. The telescope itself would barely fit in this room altogether. Hubble could just park right here. James Webb would just barely fit in this room. The mirror is gold-plated 18 hexagonal mirror segment sitting on this beautiful sun shield like a flower sitting on a petal in some water. 
This is a, a kind of zoom in CGI of it where you can see, so for people who are unfamiliar with how telescopes work, the light comes in from space, bounces off this primary mirror, bounces off a secondary mirror right there, and into this tiny little hole here where it goes to the instruments that are back here. And so those instruments uh, are, we'll talk about in a second, um, and, and I'll talk about why there's this big sun shield as well, but that's the pathway of the light. It's not like a telescope you might know where it's got a big tube like Hubble. It's open air, so, so that is uh, because it's so big, it would be very hard to fit a tube in there. In fact, the way that it's going to launch into space is in a folded up in a rocket. Very, I went and gave a talk on this at an origami art exhibit at the Tucson Botanical Gardens last year, but it like has to this beautiful unfolding process once it gets out to space, which is very beautiful, but also terrifying as a person who hopes that it all works when it goes to space. Um, when it goes to space, it's not going to do what Hubble does, where Hubble just orbits our planet. It's actually going to go a million miles away to a spot uh, beautifully labeled L2 for Lagrange point 2. And what that is, to do a little dance for you guys, again, this is a humanities conference, so I'm going to do a little dance for you guys. Imagine my head is the sun. Imagine that this is the Earth. L2 is a spot that stays on the other side of the Earth from the sun. Okay, And it's actually going to kind of do this a little bit. It's going to orbit around that spot. But it just essentially keeps the Earth between it and the sun. And this is a spot where, because of how it's moving around and the gravity of the sun and the Earth together, it's a stable spot. It's a very simple physics idea, but it's going to sit way, way out there, which means if it breaks, we can't do anything about it. It's too far away. When Hubble had some issues, we could send space shuttles and space programs to it. But when you're a million miles away, well beyond the orbit of the moon, it has to work, which is why it's being thoroughly, thoroughly tested, um, including this is the sun shield. The sun shield is being tested north of Grumman right now, just outside of LAX. And the sun shield is essentially a giant parasol, a giant like umbrella on the beach to prevent the telescope from getting very, very hot. The telescope operates in a wavelength range called the infrared, which is longer wavelengths than our eyes could see. Our, this telescope is going to operate entirely in wavelengths of light we cannot see with our eyes. And as a result, it needs to be very cool because I'm right now, you as well, we all glow in the infrared just by virtue of the fact that we're warm. Our bodies are warm and we are warm blooded. And when we're warm, we glow in the infrared. That's how like infrared goggles work, uh, night vision. And the telescope cannot be warm as a result because if the telescope is warm, it's glowing in the same wavelength as trying to take a picture. It's like trying to take a picture with a camera that's on fire. You would not want that. It'd be too bright. So you want the telescope to be very cold. And as you can see, it's 185 degrees Fahrenheit on one side, which is hot, even for Tucson, and negative uh, 388 degrees Fahrenheit, which I call my time in Hanover, New Hampshire. <laughs> um, I'm from Southern California, so I'm from, I guess, like right in the middle perfectly all the time. Uh, this is what the mirror looks like. This is probably one of my favorite pictures in this whole talk. This mirror is, was, be, was built uh, and assembled at, the, uh, at Goddard Space Flight uh, Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, in this enormous clean room. There's like some windows over here that are like the, the visitor gallery windows. And I was working from a room over, over on this side with my, my, uh, my colleagues at the University of Arizona just a, a couple uh, feet away uh, while this was being assembled. Each one of these mirror segments is about 50, 60 pounds. It's like this big. It's gold plated because gold reflects infrared light. It was assembled painstakingly one mirror segment at a time and like put together. And then they lifted it up and then hung it upside down terrifyingly <laughs> just to make sure everything was working all right. Uh, it was all you know, go, like perfectly polished and perfectly smooth. Then they packaged it all up and they stuck the instruments on the back of it and they shipped it off to Houston. Um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll talk about the instruments. Here are the instruments. Let me talk about the instruments for a second because this is why I'm here. So, so when you have a big telescope, you, you need cameras on it. And there are four cameras, essentially, uh, that are attached to the telescope. The light from the mirrors gets bounced and focused onto these cameras. Like, these are very fancy cameras. This camera up here is my favorite one. This is NearCam. Uh, I'll show a better picture of this in a second. This is NearSpec. So NearCam is a University of Arizona instrument. Primary investigator is one of my personal heroes, Mar Dr. Marsha Riki. I, she was the person whose door I knocked on. She worked on Hubble on one of its main instruments. She has an enormous amount of history working on space telescopes, which is a crazy thing to say, an enormous amount of history working on space telescopes. She's incredible. Her office is just up in Stewart Observatory. She's one of the most warm, wonderful people. And she's the primary investigator on this. So she is my boss, and she's the one who, for 20, 30 years, has put together this instrument and tested it and knows more about it than anyone. She's an, an, a, like a national treasure. 
Uh, and this right here is near spec. So this is an American uh, instrument. It's, it's the University of Arizona's, like, and it's the main camera. Meaning, when you see images, those beautiful images, when they make inevitable like IMAX movies based on James Webb images, the camera will be a University of Arizona camera. So, hey, I'm Sam Price. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Uh, it's, it's very cool. Uh, and then this is near spec. Near spec is, the, um, is, the, is a European uh, instrument. It's the spectrograph. It's like a fancy prism. So instead of taking images, it spreads the light out over its component wavelengths and looks at that. It's, it's, a, it's a European telescope, uh, the primary investigator. Uh, is, an, is, is, is at European Space Agency uh, and is, is a French gentleman uh, who we work very closely because these are the two main instruments. This is MIRI up in the top right corner. My laser is uh, freaking out right now. The MIRI up in the top right corner. And MIRI is, um, is a European and American joint instrument, and it's a longer wavelength instrument. Uh, one of the American scientists is Marsha's husband, George Rieke, who's also a national treasure, and his office is just up the way. George and Marsha Rieke have worked together. George also worked on another space telescope instrument uh, called MIPS. Uh, and then down here is NEARES, which is the Canadian Space Agency instrument, and it's kind of like a prism, but also like a camera. So these all four will work in concert with each other to essentially look at the universe. And I'll talk about why that's going to be exciting for the rest of the talk. Um, this is near cam, zoomed in. Um, I want you to notice eagle-eyed viewers will notice that it looks like there's like this black plastic thing, and then it looks like what's on the top is mirrored on the bottom. Can you guys see that? That's because uh, near cam is really fancy in that when they built it, they built the two of the exact same instruments sandwiched on each other. So you, when you get an image, you don't just get one image. It's like having two cameras right next to each other. You get a big rectangular image. So you can see here, um, this, is, this is what one image will look like. It will have this region here and th the region next door. But even cooler is that inside of NearCam is like a special piece of glass that separates light at two different wavelengths. We call it a dichroic because it splits light based on its color into like the short wavelength color and the long wavelength color. So when you get an image, you get two images of the same field and then two images of the other field at different wavelengths, which is great if you want to use your time wisely. And NearCam, compared with Hubble's main imagers, they're like a little bit smaller than the size of one of these regions here. So it's very, very exciting. We, are, we have a, a whole bunch of cool stuff planned for it. So I'm pretty jazzed about this. This is when they took it and stuck it inside of uh, a big chamber in, uh, in, in Houston uh, to do some testing. They bounced light off the mirrors to make sure the mirrors could wiggle independently, each individual mirror segment. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. It launches in 2020 on an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana. It's a world collaboration. I'm very proud to be a part of this collaboration. There's a lot of great scientists just up north who are planning some of the early science that's going to be done with James Webb. And it is an expensive thing, though. It's like $8 billion. And Hubble is, you know, similarly very, very expensive. It's a huge project that NASA has undertaken. And the question then is, why, why do we do this? Why do we build these telescopes? And now for some of you in the audience, you were like, there's no, you don't need to ask that question. Of course we should build telescopes. This is, you know, it's the progress of science. But I, I think that, that this question is, I, I, I'm thinking about it in a bigger sense. Not just like, why do we invest in, in science? But more like, why as humans do we build telescopes? And when I say telescopes, I mean something broader. Humans, astronomy is, 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 is perhaps the most, the oldest science. There may be some scientists in this who might argue with that. But I think that science, that astronomy and the idea of looking up and, and wondering about the night sky is as old as humanity. Um, and, and we know this because some of the earliest scientific sites in the world are astronomy sites. This is not the playa. It's in Egypt. This is Egypt's. Stonehenge is a recreation, but essentially these stones are oriented in a way where they are oriented with conjunction to various important celestial events, sun rising, star rising, because astronomy is the foundation of both space and time. Astronomy gives us our time. The motions of the sun, the rhythms of the sky at night, and the motions of the sun, that astronomy right there, that is the foundation of linear time for humans. It gives us a change. There's a daytime and a nighttime. 
The daytime gives us bright sunlight and warmth. The nighttime gives us this incredible splendor of the sky. Things change over the seasons that tie into when we should plant and when the Nile might flood. And, and, and these are the things that touch and are, are fundamental inside of our DNA, like this, this idea that the sun rises and sets and gives life to plants, right? And we built these instruments to try to track them and understand them. Not the only one, obviously, the actual Stonehenge in, in Britain. So this is like, you know, from probably like 5,000 years before the Common Era, right? And this is, you know, like a couple thousand years before the Common Era, right? This is a similar thing, that there were important times in the year when the sun was at a very important position, and they thought, gosh, that's really, it keeps coming back to that. Let's mark that. Let's celebrate that, because th that has incredible ramifications for our, our entire lives and, and, and the, 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 the agrarian society that we live in. Um, in, in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, the Mayans built this entire temple, you know, like, you know, a thousand years ago, to Venus. Just the motions of one planet. This is El Caracal at Chichen Itza. It's a temple to Venus. The, 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 the windows up there point towards important spots where Venus is. And we've found Mayan codices, before they were burned by uh, the Spanish coming in, we found these existing Mayan codices that are just big tables of when Venus rose and set because we cared about this. We cared about this so much. This was the foundation of like, what, what like, you know, like the, the big questions, the, 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 the fundamental source of these big questions. What, where, what are we doing here? What, what's going on? Well, we have these patterns, and these patterns are outside of human existence, and we can write them down and try to analyze them and, and try to put you know, significance to them, both religious and, and personal. Um, Here's, uh, in Wyoming, a medicine wheel, which is the Native Americans doing a very similar thing. Horizon astronomy. These lines line up, and the rocks line up with important rising and setting, right? So we're all grappling with this. And so the reason we build telescopes is this is big question. This big, big question that, 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 that we've grappled with. And astronomy is like the latest way to, 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 to look at that. The big question is, why are you here? This is the big question, not just like, why did you come to this lecture series? Because I had to, because it was interesting, because I love 930 talks. Uh, but the, 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 bigger, the bigger version of this is the version that I think astronomy, you have to grapple with. When I give talks like this to actual astronomers, they roll their eyes, because they're like, you don't, don't ask people this question. That, that's not why we're here. We're here because we want to understand exactly the interstellar medium's relationship to stellar birth. No, 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 no. I, I, I want to think about this question, because I think that you do yourself a disservice if you approach science without thinking about a bigger picture question of the point of this. And I think that for astronomy, why are you here is the big question to ask. Because all that we're trying to do is figure that out, I think, as people. Why are we here? What's going on? What's our purpose? And um, to do that, I want to uh, share with you guys a story uh, that starts 13.7 billion years ago. And you are a part of it, so, so, so watch out. Um, so 13.7 so billion years ago, this is, a, this is a big, big, big thing I'm about to do. Um, the, um, the universe began. <laughs> Uh, and it began in this incredible explosion of light that we call the Big Bang. And the Big Bang was, was a profound explosion of light and energy. And that was it. It was just light and energy streaming through the universe. And you were there. You don't believe it. But the stuff that makes you up, you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm 20 years old, I'm 15 years old, I'm 30 years old, I'm 50 years old, I'm only that old. But no, the stuff that you're made of and the energy that you use that propels you, that allows you to breathe, was there in that miasma in that Big Bang. It was there. You were there, just spread out and different. And over like you know, thousands of years, millions of years, you cooled down. The energy uh, of the universe cooled down. And for a long time, the universe was just light. And then that light was turned into very simple gases, hydrogen and helium. Again, you were there, just very simple. And for a long time, the universe was dark. We call this the Dark Ages, because it was a period of time when stars had not been born yet. And slowly, the gas clouds collapsed and coalesced, and they heated up. And they moved faster, and they started giving off a little bit of light. And in the very dense cores of these gas clouds, these pristine gas collapsed down and started to fuse. This process of taking the simple gas and pushing it together. 
and releasing enormous amount of light. And so you're seeing here a simulation, because the thing is, is that we don't exactly know how this process happened. We have to simulate it because it's very hard to observe. In fact, you might need a giant telescope that would barely fit in this room to analyze that. And that's one of the reasons why James Webb was designed. It was designed to probe this early process, the opening up of the universe, the end of the Dark Ages, when the universe experienced this renaissance of like things happening that had never happened before in the universe. Baby stars being born for the first time. And they don't live very long because they're enormous, these first stars, we think. And they explode. And that, that gas goes into forming new baby stars, and those explode. You can see this here in the simulation. The star has exploded and is releasing this shell of light that's passing and lighting up the universe. But this, this process, which we call reionization, is fundamentally important for you. If this didn't happen, you wouldn't be here. If this didn't happen, humanity would be a lot more boring. <laughs> because this right here, the early stars, were doing something that has ramifications and that we need to study as astronomers and that there are many study, uh, astronomers trying to study and James Webb is uniquely positioned to try to study because of its wavelength range and the size of its mirror. Because inside of those stars, the thing that is happening is that stars are taking this simple hydrogen and they're turning it into more complicated stuff. They're taking hydrogen and going, hey, now it's helium. Oh, cool. Oh, look, helium. Now it's carbon. This cannot happen anywhere else right now. Because fusion is very, very, very difficult to do. It requires incredible pressures and energies that only the core of a star can fuel. And so we look at this process and we start to see this go together as hydrogen and helium and more and more of these atoms start to be pushed together. And what goes on is as these stars start to push together these atoms, those atoms get eventually spat out into the universe to form new generations of stars. And so you're seeing here that at the cores of some of these stars, you hit iron, which means that the star cannot support itself, and the star will eventually explode in a supernova, an enormous explosion that is great for us, because it means that all of the gas and stuff that was made in that star is suddenly pushed outward into the universe. And why is that important? Well, because you guys are made out of carbon. And where did that carbon come from? A star had to die so you could be put together. That is a thing I like to tell people that they do not believe. Your fingers are made of stuff that was put together inside of a star initially. The, th the reason that you are here right now is because stars lived their lives and died before you were born to put the atoms together. It gets crazier. I'm wearing a ring that's made out of silver. Maybe you're wearing some gold. Heavy elements don't just get made in dying stars. They get made when you have two stars that are dead. We just learned this last year. Two stars that are dead. We learned this last year, and I haven't updated my, my, my video to, to show this. Two stars that are dead coalescing in some sort of crazy, terrible death tango to explode, and in that process, energetically, all of the heaviest elements are created. Gold was created when two stars had previously died and then crashed into each other. This is mind-blowing, because it is a thing that makes you realize that you are not just a you know like like this old in the history of the universe you are actually part of a series of things that stretch all the way back to when you were light energy floating around through the cosmos and the way that i like to think about it is that a long time ago if you could put little tracers on all of your atoms in the universe then for like one brief second those atoms were in stars and they were out and then for just a tiny bit whoosh, they're you and then after you're gone they'll be spread out in the universe again so you are a collection of seven billion, billion, billion atoms that were created inside of stars as those stars lived and then died and then collected slowly to make what we know around us. And what's cool about, about this is that the way we know this is from observations. And the way that we're going to learn this better is through James Webb. James Webb is designed in the infrared to look at galaxies that are farther than any galaxies we've ever seen. It will make Hubble look like, like, it, like just, it's looking at the foreground. How, James Webb, I, and the, worse, the work that I do just up uh, north of here, is trying to look at the light from one of these little fuzzy blobs and figure out exactly how far away it is, which means I can tell you how far away we're gonna see things. And it's almost peering back, almost peering all the way back to those first stars and that first end of the Dark Ages gas. And over time, and over James Webb's lifetime, we will slowly and actually probably hint at getting at those stars. And why is that important? Because that gives us a chance 
to look at the evolution of heavy elements in the universe, to look at how the universe went from light to putting you together. Just this beautiful record as we slowly march forward, because we can look at these, because astronomers are very smart, we can look at these fuzzy blobs and tell you how many stars are being born every year. What's the chemical makeup of those elements uh, in the gas there? Like, you know, how big is it? Is it a spiral? Like, we can tell a huge amount from this. It's harder with the really f little fuzzy far away ones. Mostly we're just hoping to find those. That, you know, that's, that's the first step. But for a lot of the stuff, we're going to be able to really get in and understand exactly what's going on and therefore make, an, like, make a timeline of just the history of the universe's heavy elements, which is pretty profoundly important. And so this is the image that I want to start with. This is why we study, why we build these telescopes. This is an image of Congress Street here in Tucson back in like 19, I don't know, 15, 1920. Uh, and what's cool is if I ha handed this to you, you're probably looking around and going like, do I recognize that as Congress Street? What's going on? What's I, what's, you know, I think that this is looking towards a mountain down the street right there, right? So this is looking towards the west. And I think that you, what you do is what I do when you look at an image like this, which you kind of like zoom in on a lot of stuff and go like, oh man, there's like a shoe store on the street here. I can zoom in on that thing there. Or like, oh, look what this kid's wearing. Like he's got like a fun neckerchief and like this little cap on his bike, right? But you're limited, when an, with an image like this, you're limited to the resolution of the image, right? Like, it's hard to see. I zoomed this in. It's hard to see. Is that like a little red cross? What's going on on that, right? And astronomy is the same way. But astronomy is kind of cool. This image is one of the you know, images that we have in the, you know, the Arizona Museum of, uh, 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 University of Arizona Museum uh, to show historically what old Tucson looked like. But we're limited to whoever decided to stand out in the middle of the street and take a picture, right? Uh, by that. But astronomy is cool because our telescopes can take images of the past and take better and better images of the past as we get better cameras, right? So when we say a telescope is a time machine, it's literally like looking back. But instead of looking at all these people and looking at the zoom in, we now can make better and better telescopes to look at the same thing. This is an image of Congress Street uh, <laughs> billions of years ago. Now, this is an image of galaxies stretching back. This is that same image I just zoomed through, but a much higher resolution. Every dot in this, except for the ones with the spikes here and here, uh, there might be the other ones, but every image, everything here that doesn't have spikes is a galaxy, every one of these. So this little thing right there, it's a galaxy. It's a galaxy, it's a galaxy, it's a galaxy. Galaxies have about 100 billion stars. We live in one called the Milky Way. So you're looking at untold numbers of stars, stellar systems, potentially planets, and you're looking at an image that stretches back as far as we've ever seen. So this is like looking at not just a baby picture, but it's like looking at one of those like family reunion pictures where you see all the generations together. That is what you're seeing here. And James Webb will take an image of this that will just blow this out of the water. Not just from the fact that it's going to see far the little smudgers, but also like here's a zoom in on one of these galaxies where you can see that it's, just, it's kind of like, okay, it's blue and white. Like this one right here. What's going on? But James Webb, and if you ran a simulation, James Webb will allow the resolution of individual groups of star forming. And also, you can see that there's entire other galaxies that you wouldn't be able to see to begin with out there. James Webb is going to revolutionize the field of galaxy evolution. It's going to do that thing I just described and understand it not just in a hand wavy detail, but like really do that. That was why it was one of the main reasons why it was built. And it's very exciting. It's very, very exciting. Because galaxies are incredibly diverse. And the question of why they're this diverse is like one of the foundational questions in my field. Right? And the reason that we care about this, and the reason why this is important, is because this is like an like like the diversity is something that we get excited about. When astronomers and when scientists see that there's a type of object that is incredibly diverse, we get very excited. Diversity is very cool for astronomy because it is a thing where we can go, why? Why? What's going on there? Why? Like, you're probably looking at this and already picking out things that astronomers pick out. Like, some of these are blue. Some of them are red, ish, yellow red, right? Some of them are really pretty spirals. Some of them are, I guess, ball blobs, right? Like, these are, like, some of them have these things in front of them, right? Like, this is, this is what astronomers like look at and get excited about, and James Webb will be able to have the resolution to trace the evolution to, to, to trace the evolution of properties, these morphological properties, why they look like this, which is really very, very exciting, right? And for close by galaxies, we can like use the telescope to look actually at them in a way we haven't before. This is a Hubble image of the Whirlpool galaxy, but notice there's a bunch of this kind of red uh, spirally stuff that's in the middle of the arms. That's dust, it's kind of like soot, 
and uh, James Webb operates in the infrared, which means we can like peer right through that soot, because infrared light will pass through a lot of that dust, and we can peer past the dust. Dust is a pain in the butt for astronomers, because it blocks what we want to see. But if we have the ability to peer through it, we can start to see how stars are being born in and see individual groups of stars in distant galaxies, which has near, never before been done and with this resolution. And so when you start to do that, you can take these images like I showed you at Hubble image here and peer inside of those little dusty cores here. Here's, here's an, a, a zoom in of uh, a star forming region and then the same region in the infrared down here. And you can see, ah, what's going on up there? I don't know. Ah, there's a group of baby stars in there. Why? Why do we care about that? Well, I'm not done with our journey yet. The reason we care about the birth of baby stars is because and let's flash back about five billion years ago. We're in a young version of the Milky Way. And in this young version of the Milky Way, there is a big gas cloud. And you were there. Again, not put together. And slowly, the gas cloud collapsed. And that gas cloud had dust, which blocked the way like a little cocoon. And those little cores collapsed. And eventually, one of those got hot enough in the very center that it started to fuse. And it turned on. And around that, there's this enormous amount of um, there's an enormous amount of uh, like little rocks that like are left over from this process, and those little rocks are coalescing as well. Those little rocks are collapsing to form a group of little planets around this star. And these planets are young, and they they're vastly different sizes, and they are um, and some of them are are, are very hot like one of them about third out, is very hot. And over time, um, little rocks from space keep crashing into it and delivering water on there. And you're starting to, to build this. And, and, and it's violent. It's a very violent period of time, because all little rocks are still spreading out through this little nascent system. And the little rocks are crashing into all of the other planets. And so we're getting this, this one rock, that, which we'll call Earth, I guess, uh, is getting bombarded with little rocks from space. It's bringing water, but it's also, it, at one point, something crashes into the Earth and knocks a chunk off, which starts to orbit around us. And thank goodness this thing happens. Thank goodness this thing creates a moon, because a moon delivers us the tides. And the tides are really amazing for the young life that is starting to develop on this little blue ball. This moon is mixing the tides up, which might have an evolutionary help to like mix up and diversify. And so the thing is, is that starting from the Big Bang, the universe took light and then slowly created life, from light to life. That's what the universe did for you to be here. And you have to value that. That's an amazing miracle that has happened, right? And the big question, like, and, and so, so the life that, that stepped forward onto this like, was underneath a sky that was filled with evidence of this possibly happening other places. The night sky is a reckoning with what has happened. Right? You see our own galaxy stretched out. In our galaxy, you see groups of star-forming regions. You can actually see a star-forming region with your naked eye and, and Orion on a, on a dark night. You can see these star-forming groups. You can see other stars. It is a reckoning that it is a thing like you, you can believe, as many people did, that we're at the very center of things. But the night sky is a reminder that we are not. And I think that that's a terrifying thing for a lot of people. We, we build, like in the last 100 years, the Industrial Revolution has brought uh, you know, electrical street lights and, and all sorts of lights. And so now we literally live in a world where we spend a lot of our times trying to ignore the fact that the sky is beautiful and above us, especially at night, by turning a light on our face and pointing it directly at our face at all times. I know this. I've lived on a college campus for many years. Uh, college students really get excited about cell phone light in their face. Uh, and like, this is the thing that like, we, up until a couple hundred years ago, up until a hundred years ago, this was every night. We lived in a world where this was the reckoning we had to make every single night. And why is that also important? Because we're not the only solar system out there. We're actually finding evidence that there are solar systems around pretty much every star. It's hard to find these, though, because stars are very bright. Very, very bright. And you have to find these tiny things that don't glow on their own, that are just orbiting it barely. Studying planets is a very cool thing. A lot of astronomers do. Some of my colleagues down the hall are, 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 are planet people. And they are very excited about this, because we're just now entering a time where it's not just like collecting you know, systems, but understanding what's going on there is fundamental. right? And so this is the big question that we as scientists 
like and as human beings are going to have to reckon with in the next 20 years, which is this idea that like, okay, we've looked out at the night sky, we've wondered where we are, we can trace the history of our being put here, but has this happened anywhere else? I think the biggest discovery in all of science, and this is very, very self-centered, but I think the biggest discovery in all of science is going to be an astronomy discovery of the existence of life outside of our planet. The fact that we did not walk this journey from the beginning to here alone. And we're just now entering, because it's very, very hard to look at planets. And so James Webb is designed in part to look at the atmospheres of planets in a very clever way. Sometimes planets will orbit right in front of their host stars. And in that tiny bit of time, light can pass just grazing through that tiny onion skin of an atmosphere. Just barely through that. And we can see what light gets scattered out from that and look at what's left over light through the atmosphere and tell you a little about what's going on in the atmosphere. That is something that's being done by my colleagues and it is very difficult. I do not do this because it's very, very difficult to do. I work on galaxies because relatively it's a little easier than trying to suss out the goings on of an atmosphere of a planet that is you know, incredibly distant, right? And what, they're fi what we're hoping to find is evidence that atmosphere has things in it that may be evidence that something's going on there Besides just, oh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's like a big Jupiter. There's nothing really, there, you know, we don't see any life. It's a big gas giant. Instead, it'd be great if we could look at planet atmospheres and say, ah, oxygen, ozone, methane. Maybe there's cows burping on that planet as well, right? Like, this is the thing about, about atmosphere sciences, that our atmosphere tells a lot about what is using the atmosphere, right? And another very cool thing that James Webb will be able to do is that James Webb will be actually able to take images, direct images of those planets, which is so hard. It's like if I took one of those um, big spotlights they use to advertise like car sales and just pointed it all over your face right now, and you're like, oh, this is too bright. But then I put like a, a little firefly on the edge. Can you see the firefly? No, you can't see the firefly. There's a giant bright light in your face, right? You can see just how bright this star is. And we've blocked, this is a, a, an example, a simulation. We've blocked a lot of the light from the star with this occulter. And yet even then, you have to do some very clever spinning and twisting to slowly get at the planet. Direct images of planets outside of our solar system. This is a revolution because this allows us to see these planets that are growing and to see how they shape the young solar system that they're growing into and how the young solar system shapes them. Because we are always asking ourselves, why are we here? And astronomy gives us a chance to see that happening, see the processes happening that put us here in the universe, mirrored back at us. We have a time machine. We have a time machine and we have an ability to look at the universe around us and actually piece together all of the parts that put us together. And that is one of the unique joys of being an astronomer, is that I get an opportunity to, instead of wondering, I, when I was a kid, I, I could either study dinosaurs or space. Those are the only two things I could ever imagine myself studying. And I, at one point said, I'll never see a dinosaur in my life, but I will see a galaxy, and I will find a black hole, and I will find pictures of them, and I have, and it's been great. I love paleontology, it's a very cool science, but I just, I wanted to be able to see the things that were the answers to my questions. And astronomy gives us this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up with, with the kind of roundabout thing, which is, and, 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 and humanities-wise, the, the, the kind of reason why. This, first off, there's this quote that I, I like from John Muir, who says that when we contemplate the whole globe as one giant great dewdrop, striped and dotted with continents and islands, flying through space with other stars, all singing and shining together as one, this is the important part here, the whole universe appears as an infinite storm of beauty. And I really like the, the word there, infinite storm of beauty, because he uses the word storm to describe this. He's looking, this is from a, uh, his travel logs when he's going up to Alaska and he's looking at clouds, so he's in a very stormy mind. But he refers to the universe as an infinite storm of beauty, because we sometimes think of, think of storms as dangerous, and, and they can be, but storms are creative forces, right? That's the reason we call a brainstorm. It's a creative force. And the universe was a creative force that put together so much beauty. The universe as infinite storm of beauty. I really like that. Thanks, John. Uh, but I, I, I think that, that when, when people often talk about astronomy and when you, when you go see astronomy videos and movies and stuff, like or go to IMAX, you'll hear like, like some big booming voice, you know. The universe is vast and you are tiny compared. And I, I hate that. I hate that. Because 
that otherizes science. Like, like you know, 14 billion, like just, it makes you feel like insignificant. And people tell me, they ask me, they go, Kevin, I, I, how do you do it? I just, sometimes I look out at night and I feel so small and so nothing. And I think that that, that is the, the, my central charge as a scientist, is that you should stop otherizing science and start internalizing science. Because you should look at science as from the point of view of a human, not from the point of view of some cold robot who's trying to not use their emotions and, use and understand the beauty of the universe and understand the beauty of the thing that you do. Because if you do that, you will remember that 14 billion years ago, the universe put you together from light itself in varied and interesting ways. It put people together in strange, interesting ways. And all of them were set under the same sky, looking up at the same stars. Some of the stories were shared over time. We can look at certain groups and patterns of stars and recognize that one culture that never talked to another culture looked at it and saw the same thing. And this all is profoundly connecting you. The stars connect us. They do not dwarf us. They are a thing that exists, and we exist alongside of it because of the actions of these stars. You are this assemblage of 7 billion, billion, billion atoms flying through the universe on this crazy spaceship that is one of the only places where we see liquid water, which is good because it's good to drink. And we are the beneficiaries of an incredible amount of things that have happened to put us here. So I'm going to finish with that idea that you should not feel small by the universe, but you should instead look at the universe the way that you look at any art, as an understanding and, 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 and as, a, as, a, as an example of the human experience reflected back. The universe puts you together, and you need to put the universe together inside of your brain. <coughs> because it is the most incredible thing to have put you together to be here, okay? So uh, if you have any questions, my name is Dr. Kevin Hainline, and I'd love to answer them right now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, all right. Questions. So I see one in the back over here. This is my favorite part when a microphone is shuttled around. I used to, there, there's a microphone that people have that's like in a big fuzzy thing that they throw around a room, which is really very exciting. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd first just like to compliment you on a talk that was maximum in its clarity. Oh, thank you. And in its enthusiasm. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question sure. uh, about the title. Yes. Why, why are we here? And when I saw that, I thought, wait a second, you know, is, does this go to purpose? <laughs> and then you explained it as a concatenation of uh, events over yes. billions of years. Uh, but you concluded that with the question, uh, what is our purpose? So that's a humanities question yeah. I'm asking you. Huh. Uh, what, what is our purpose? <laughs> okay. Um. I'm going to talk about this from the point of view of a scientist, in case there's any of my colleagues in the room who are going to roll their eyes. Uh, that is partially a religious question, and I don't know if I have it within me to answer that from the point of view of a scientist. But from the point of view of a human being, over here, scientists stay over there, the point of view of a human being, I think that when you are the beneficiary of events that have happened, I think that the only purpose that you must have inside of you is to relish that and find joy in that and use that as to love. I think that, that like this is very touchy-feely and astronomers really hate when I <laughs> get to this touchy-feely, but I think that like our primary purpose as human beings is to love and to like hold on to the fact that, that we are all this crazy assemblage on this thing and not use that to like gain power over other, like th th that's like a, a silly thing. Like if things happen to put you together and you're a delicate miracle, why would you do anything else but celebrate the delicate miracles that are around you? And so I think that that's the primary purpose. Now, scientifically, um, that gets into religion and a bunch of stuff that I, I don't have any purpose over and maybe there's some theologian in the room who like has a better explanation, but like that is the big thing that humans have grappled with is what it really is our purpose. And I think that like when you're so like, you know, incredibly, like, vastly complicated and from nothing, you have to 
share that and be enthusiastic about that and like hold on to that by loving as hard as you can. So hopefully that's the touchy-feely answer to your question. <laughs> yes, in the blue behind. And then I think there's a question down here. I guess it's Teal. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for what you've uh, told us so far. Einstein. Yes. Imagination is more important than knowledge. <laughs> I think that that's okay. what separates us as, as a and creature. I'm aware that Kepler and Einstein and um, Newton had <laughs> spiritual lives that were very, very important to their mm -hmm. work. And Einstein made that very clear by the way he lived in the last half of his life especially. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you in the imagination department <laughs> to share with us some of your ruminations uh, that about the statistics and probability of the way that this kind of a situation here is distributed in the universe. So. And, and you know, it's like starting with our own Milky Way and going out to uh, what you have shown us here yeah, with these so some of these images. Thank you. So the problem with statistics is that it's, it's very cold and it's also reliant on us having other examples. This is the big problem with anyone trying to do statistics to look at the universe, is that we have one example of life. It's here on the Earth. And when you just have one example, you can't do statistics. You can do some, but they're a very small number and they don't, they're, they're mostly pulled out of nowhere. And so there are a lot of things that could have happened and didn't. And we exist, but we would we would not have existed if they did not go right. So we, you know, there's this 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 principle that says like, well, you know, we we feel special, but also we wouldn't be here to feel special if it didn't go our way. And so, you know, there's this survivorship bias. Statistically, a lot of things happened that are pretty profound to put us here, and I'm very happy about that. I don't know if I can give you numbers to say that. Um, I I I want to go back though to your statement about imagination from, from Einstein, I think imagination is really very underrated as the thing that makes us human beings, like the thing that separates us from a lot of different creatures, is the fact that we have this imagination born from many different possible reasons why we might have this, you know, maybe just evolutionarily like fight or flight, well, if we can imagine the possible scenarios that might help us. But like the fact that we can imagine like, that's why we do a lot of the things we do. That's why we build telescopes, is because we can imagine the things we might see. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that you brought that up, because I, 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 I think that the more that you exercise that imagination as a muscle and as a thing that you use, and the more that you don't shut yourself off to the fact that you are a creative being, human beings in this room, like, you know, if you're not doing something that requires some imagination, because of many reasons we might shut that off. You know, there's an embarrassment. We're like, I, I can't be imaginative. That's silly. Like, let me tell you, I am the silliest person you'll ever meet in your life. I am the most enthusiastic, imaginative. I try to be so much, and it has never steered me wrong. Do not worry about other people criticizing you for being imaginative, because it is the best muscle you can, you can use, and it's something that will only make you happier. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I don't know if I can help you super much about the statistics part, because right now we just know one example, and it's a great one, but uh, until, like, talk to me once James Webb has started discovering, once we've discovered that life may exist other places, because then we have a couple other examples, and then it's really, we're off to the races. I think there was a question down up front, yes. I think there were two, yeah. Uh, so I was really curious about your experiences with the public versus your colleagues in your ideas and personal viewpoints on this. I, I, I joke about this a little bit. Um, I think that science uh, is, is like thought of, like you go, to, you go to like a lot of school for science and it like weeds out a lot of people, which is bad. Uh, it weeds them out for bad reasons um, because there's a very competitive aspect to, to science. And I think that science at its best is very collaborative. And I'm very lucky I work with a lot of collaborative people, but I, I have a different background to, to, to like why I do a lot of this outreach stuff and I have a lot of experience doing it and, and speaking about these sorts of things, which means that I have been able to speak in contexts where I've not gotten pushback. But a lot of astronomers, most of their talking experience comes and most of their outreach and sharing experience comes in a very formal lecture-based or, or colloquium research experience thing. And so they just don't have an opportunity to go out and say something that's inside of their heart and say something that's more exciting and more enthusiastic uh, and not like in a judgment-free zone. Like I'm very happy that I'm in front of a group of people 
who like are not gonna you know be sassy, but like there are astronomers who definitely like think that any amount of humor or any amount of like spirituality is is taking steps too far. Uh, I'm very lucky because I think that uh, we're entering in a time when astronomy, uh, a lot of the young people coming to astronomy are coming from very diverse backgrounds and bringing their diverse points of view. And it's not nearly as diverse as it should be at all. And by the way, if any of you want to be astronomers, please do. Uh, we would love to have more young astronomers. Um, but like these young astronomers are starting to bring more of the human element to astronomy. And I'm very, very blessed that like there are more astronomers who do art and who write poetry and who paint and who like you know dance than there have ever been in the history of astronomy. And that's very, very exciting because it means that this thing where I get worried about what would my astronomer friends think if they saw my talk uh, is going to be less and less of an issue. Yes. So, yes. Thank you for that. Write down a couple. Um, my question was, so like multiple times you referred to the Webb telescope mm -hmm. as like a time machine. Yes. And I was just curious, like how is it, like how, what makes it like a time machine? So here's, here's my example. Here's my example. Imagine um, that you live in the 1800s, and the only way that you get your mail is from New York is that someone gets on a horse and rides that to you, right? So you tell your friend, hey, write me a letter. And your friend writes you a letter and then gives that to you, right? And it takes a while. So when you get that letter, you're not getting it from your friend as they just wrote it the other day. Maybe it's like, like you know, I got a haircut today, and you get the letter. Wow, they got a haircut. But you're not getting the information about what they got today. You're getting the information about what they got like you know, a week ago, right? Or maybe it's even longer. Maybe it's like a really slow Pony Express writer, like a month ago. Like maybe it's something where like you're getting news from the continent, right? Like some from Britain, and like that news had to get on a ship and come across and get on a horse and come across. And so you're getting this letter, right? So you're not actually getting information as it is right now. You're getting it as it was. You're you're getting information. And similarly, because light travels in a finite speed. The light that we see just in the stars has taken, you're seeing that light as it left 10, 15 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, which is really cool, by the way. Think about right now. There's light traveling through the universe, traveling through the universe, and in a couple nights, you will look up at it and see it. It's been traveling for 1,000 years. It's just two days away from seeing your eyes. That's like a pretty cool thing, right? But that means you're seeing those stars as they were 10 years ago, because that's 10-year-old light, 1,000 years ago. With James Webb, we're going to see light that's traveling through the universe for like 13 13.2 billion years, which means, which means, right now it's at the traveling through the light the universe. It's been traveling the universe through the entire history of the universe. This light traveling the universe, and we're just a couple ways uh, years away from putting a telescope up in space. It's going to finally capture that light. And when we see those things, we're not going to see them as the galaxies are right now. We're seeing them as it was when the light left the galaxy. Just like you're hearing about your friend as she was when she wrote that letter. And so that is why when I show you that picture of Congress Boulevard, we can take a picture like that of distant galaxies and see them as they were. And if we want to find ones that are a little bit older, we look a little farther away where light's taking a little longer. So it's a time machine. Like, I mean, it doesn't take us there, but it gives us pictures of that, which is very cool. Does that answer your question? Cool. All right. I, th I don't know how many more questions I can answer. Uh, someone should kick me off when I'm not, because otherwise I will just continue asking questions. So here in the white, I think. First of all, thank you for the talk. Of um, and my question actually comes in response to your response to the first question, because um, you mentioned um, about religion. And I yeah. just did a disclaimer, not a theologian, but a religious study scholar. Cool. So I was actually struck through the entire talk how some of the, the language that you used mirrored mythic language. So one that I noted down was, a star was born and died so that you can live, mm -hmm. uh, which already has this sort <laughs> oh of yeah, um, yeah. teleological <laughs> um, understanding. So. Um, and then we get to the end of the talk, you started talking about how the far offness of science uh, blocks something that's humanistic uh, and that we need to see it as part of us. Yes. And I actually was thinking about, at that point, some theories of what how myth functions as a parallax, which, you know, borrowing again <laughs> the same term, You're welcome. but the, the, <laughs> the far off and the, and the nearby, and that uh, that's important for humanity to be able to reflect on the same question of, of why we are here, that... Mm -hmm we are here but we recognize the far off and go moving back and forth between those two points of view yeah. makes us understand things differently so my question for you then is um can you tell reflect a little bit on how sort of the idea of science actually fulfilling the the same function as 
myth or mythic language. Well, I mean, that, that, that like, what's great is that if you just trace it all the way back, like, the, the, our understanding and reckoning with myth and story, like, branches off from astronomy, like, at the very beginning of time, right? Like, like we had stories and shared stories about the things that were happening and then applied those stories directly to the stars. Our star stories are, you know, the, the, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is actually the Great Bear. The Great Bear is, you know, seen by many molt cultures that we can trace back as a bear with hunters or a bear with cubs. There is myth right there, right? So astronomy is the story of myth become more cold and rational, right? Like, it's, it's as as we realize, like, okay, well, the stars are not painted on crystal spheres. They're actually these far away things. And I am saying that scientists want to just, like, push that aside and say, like, okay, we, we can't. But you can't reckon with, with the, the, the universe without interpreting it through the stories that, like, you know, because, you know, like, the way that we can understand this is with, with the stories, like, it's, this, is, this is a huge question that I don't know if I'm really properly ready to answer after a, a big talk, but like, I, I think that like, like we, we have to because it is like inside of us like as storytelling creatures and that we have to, because it, especially like just as, as specific, like all I do is write papers. That's what we do. Our, our, our language as academics is papers. And let me tell you, when you read a paper that is written by someone who's trying to write in a very cold, rational way, it's not nearly as exciting as when you write, read a paper by someone who understands the metaphor and understands the story they're weaving of the topic they're looking at. And I think that like, like you have to bring that in, just as an academic, I have to bring that in to be a more warm person. But also, just as a person to exist in the universe, to exist as a person, I have to reckon with, I have to think about the, the, the stories and the, like, uh, like the way that I build stories in my brain with respect to the thing that I'm studying. This is rambling, I understand, I'm sorry. Uh, but like, but I would love to talk with you afterwards a little bit more because I, I don't have a lot of opportunities to talk with, with religious studies people and I think there's a huge amount of that. I think that maybe I have to finish up. So thank you guys very much. Uh, Hi, everyone. I just want to make a quick announcement because we've had a lot of questions. If you pick up one of these flyers, you have humanities.arizona.edu um, forward slash tech. Uh, there will be a link to all of these lectures on that page. So if you want to see it, if you're not going to be here tomorrow or you just want to go back and see it, they're going to be on there. And it'll also be on our YouTube channel. Thank you. All right. Okay, we'll take a quick two minutes break for um, bathroom break. And in about two minutes, we'll start with the next presentation. Bathroom on the this, this side.
Okay, we will start again pretty soon. Okay, thank you. We're about to, to start again. And I would, I would like to, to take um, a, a few minutes just to, to say a little bit about uh, this series and to, uh, to thank uh, our uh, alumni, uh, Jackie and, uh, and Bennett Dorrance, for their support uh, of this series uh, through the Dorrance uh, Scholarship Programs, uh, as well as uh, Jim Ensley, uh, who is the director of the Dorrance uh, Scholarship Program. This is uh, thanks to, to them that we are able to, to have this series uh, here uh, at the university through the College of Humanities. Uh, so a, a little bit about the Dorans uh, scholarship programs. It sponsors uh, not only this new series, but is a longtime uh, supporter of students awarding scholarships uh, since 1999 to first generation undergraduate college students in Arizona and in Hawaii. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dorrance both earned bachelor degrees in French here at the University of uh, Arizona, and they were named the uh, College of Humanities uh, Alumni of the Year in, uh, in 2012. And uh, uh, as I told them when we, when we first met uh, uh, back then, I, I feel like they really are the perfect example uh, for our current and fu future students uh, uh, to, to follow because they have put to good use the, the skills that one acquires by studying the the humanities, uh, skills like empathy, social responsibility, leadership, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creative problem solving, all these important skills that our students uh, are able to, to study uh, in our disciplines in the, in the College of, uh, of Humanities. And um, uh, this vision that uh, uh, the Dorans had for the, for the students in the, in the scholarship uh, uh, program of educating uh, future leaders of the, the global economy is a, 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 and having this connection between the humanities and the, the new technologies is something that we, we definitely share uh, in our college uh, of, the, um, of the humanities. Uh, study abroad is another uh, important aspect uh, of that vision. And so we have been fortunate to work with the with the Doran Scholarship Programs on a study abroad program uh, that uh, was designed for the, for the students who study one semester uh, in Italy to one of our uh, location uh, as part of the, uh, of the, of the program. And uh, another thing that we are doing 
uh, as part of this vision of combining the humanities with the science is that we have created a new degree uh, that has been approved and that will start in the fall uh, of 2018 in collaboration with uh, several colleges on campus, the LR College of Management, uh, the College of Public Health, the College of Architecture, uh, and the College of Agriculture, and it's going to be a BA in Applied Humanities that is going to combine uh, the humanities, those skills that we, we, we teach and that we learn in the humanities, with some of those other disciplines uh, that are uh, represented. And, and, and this is kind of the point two of this, uh, of this series, again, is to show the connection uh, between, the, uh, between those, uh, th th those different uh, uh, disciplines and how they complete uh, each other. Because uh, at first, you know, it, it may seem counterintuitive uh, that uh, the Doran Scholarship Program and, and Jim and Slee would have contacted us uh, to do a, a, a series that, that deal with, uh, with uh, 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 technology and the technology program. Uh, but really, as you will see with all the speakers, and you already saw with the first one, it makes total sense because one cannot go without the other. Okay, this idea of how the humanities and the arts are really center uh, to this new world of, uh, of technology is something that uh, is very important and that we are uh, looking forward to, to continuing this discussing. So I want to, to thank again uh, uh, the, the program, the Dorrance Scholarship Program for, for the help with this and it's great to see the, the students again and to, to have them with, uh, with us today. So the, get the next uh, presenter for the series is uh, Kevin Shaw. Uh, Kevin Shaw is CTO and founder of Algorithmic Intuition. He is a lifelong entrepreneur with a deep love of technology. He has strong experience in startup, semiconductors, business development, product development, and team building. He has a PhD in electrical engineering, micro uh, electromechanical systems from Cornell University, a master's in management from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, and 30 US patents in MEMS and algorithms. He also minored in the humanities as an undergraduate student. He is an adjunct faculty at Singular Singularity Univers University for uh, MEMS, sensors, and IoT. He was CTO of Sensor Platforms Inc. from 2009 until its acqui acquisition by audience in 2014. Before that, he established the Sensor Algorithms team and ran business development. Previously, he co-founded co-founded his first company soon after college uh, that was sold in 2004 and worked at Kionix Inc., a MEM semiconductor foundry uh, that was acquired in 2000. The title of his lecture today is Exponential Technology, Machine Learning and Their Impact on the 21st Century. Dr. Kevin Shaw. Speakers work? No? Oh, there we go. All right, now we got some sound. Let me put on a timer here. All right, good. Um, good morning to all. Um, I am in awe of our first speaker, and I do not know how I'm going to be able to follow that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am not an academic, I, I am a technologist. Um, I can't talk about things as grand as uh, the Big Bang and black holes, but I can tell you something about technology and what we're able to do. Um, today I want to talk about exponential technology, which is sort of an odd topic, but I think it describes some of the change that we're feeling in the world today. We know something's shifting, we know something great is happening, but we can't quite put our finger on it. I want to try and give you some insight into that. Um, we'll start off by talking about what exponential thinking is, why, why I think something's happening. We'll talk about machine learning and why it's having such a powerful impact on our world. And lastly, how does that change how we see opportunities going forward? If the jobs we knew of, if the products we knew of growing up no longer exist, where do we find opportunity for ourselves? There was a time. There was a time when all weather was local. Information was local. Everything I wanted to know, I had to get myself. In the time before the smartphone, before the weather channel, before Facebook, before the telephone, if I wanted to know 
the weather for my crops, for my farm, for my family. I had only one option. Well, I had two. I could look outside, or I could trust my gut. Felt like rain today. That was my only option. The, the information I got, I was fairly closed in. See, the problem is understanding what the weather was a day's horse ride away. Well, it took a horse ride for a day to get there. I couldn't know that information now because I had to take time to go get it. Much like we just heard in our first talk about the speed of light and the, the weather we might get, or the, the mail we might get via horseback across the country. I hope that's not mine. <laughs> this was our mode of travel. And it changed the way we view the world because the idea that that information could be had limited our ability to think that information mattered. I mean, if you don't know about it, how can it affect you? So in this time, ideas and information were limited. Our understanding of the broader world was limited until somebody had this fascinating idea. They could take little strips of metal, hang it on tree poles, and send signals down. Well, that came up with some interesting ideas. Because people, and here's a map of England in the 1850s, showing some of the, the early telegraph lines. And this guy had an interesting idea. Um, he had a little bit of experience with sailing. And I had an idea for why it might help sailing. If you remember the name, by the way, you know your history, he'd done some sailing aboard a ship called the HMS Beagle. Anybody heard of that? Guy named, uh, uh, guy, uh, <laughs> the guy that wrote uh, Origin of the Species, Darwin. He was the captain for that ship. And when he came back, he convinced the British government to give him some money. He trained some guys and sent them off to the corners of England. Trained them to meet, read these newfangled machines called barometers and thermometers. And their job was to watch the weather, make measurements, and hoof it down to the nearest telegraph office every couple hours. And they'd send that information by telegraph to him in London. And he was gathering information from all over England. It's not so much that he was interested in having a better picnic on Sunday. He was more interested in sailing. And that time, thousands of ships were lost. Not sailors, ships were lost every year due to bad weather. They had no idea when going out to see whether the weather would be fair or foul tomorrow. But he did. He saved thousands of lives. And in fact, the predictions that he made were so new and so noteworthy, there wasn't even a word for it. So he created one, called it a forecast. The word we, use, word we use today, he had to create. The change that this made, going back to our view of the farmer in the valley, was that the farmer could now look at a newspaper and see weather reports, not just for the next city, but in advance for what would happen several days ago, or in advance. This was shocking. The idea that you could know information a long ways away, and the idea that you could anticipate it, and that it mattered to you was shocking. And this actually led to some other interesting changes, because it was such a new idea that it actually grew and grew fast. This tiny little idea of sending copper wires across the country grew at a rapid clip. You may note the shape of this curve, or this curve about railroad growth. Starts off with a couple hundred miles. They had put up 200,000 miles of railroad lines in 50 years. These types of things start small, these little ideas, and they grow. And they grow surprisingly. So why do I start off talking about history on this fine morning? Because I wasn't talking about a farmer in the 1850s. I'm talking about us. We are so proud of what we've got. But we are just as ignorant. And our world is wrenching forward as rapidly as that man in the 1850s. But we cannot see it. It is starting off slowly, and it is growing fast. And it is very hard for us as humans to see this type of effect. It's now our turn to learn. Because I point at this little device. Does anybody here have a smartphone? <laughs> because I, I asked that semi-humorously. Do you know when this device was invented? 
the first iPhone came out? No, 2007. The iPhone was, did not exist before 2007. That was 11 years ago. 11 years ago, none of you would have had a smartphone in your hand. Now, every single one of you does. You expect information continuously, always, and at a fingertip. This is the wrenching change. There are 1.5 billion of these things sold a year, going from a product that did not exist 11 years ago. This is exponential change. Here's a plot. We'll talk about it more, another exponential curve. Um, what's kind of interesting is this point right here. Um, there's about 7 billion people on the planet. This is the point uh, about, five, about seven, eight years ago where we crossed over having one device for every man, woman, and child on the planet. We now have two to three devices for every man, woman, and the child on the planet. Does this curve say we're done? Oh, no. This curve is the plot of the number of transistors on a computer chip. We'll talk about this a little bit more. You notice a sort of similar curve there? These things start small, but they grow very quickly. And what's so hard for us as humans to understand, I mean, our brains did really good at understanding whether there was a tiger around the corner that was going to eat us. But it's not very good at exponential. See, if I ask you, how far will I go if I walk five steps? You'll nail that. Okay, I want you to double that. Okay, I'll probably be over there. Um, another three times that, I'll be over there. I got that. I'm good at linear. Now let me ask you about exponential. If I square my distance of steps, I'm not over there. I'm outside the room. If I square it again, I'm on the other side of the campus. These effects are hard to anticipate. And they make our ability to uh, forecast that very limited. And it has other impact, impacts as well. See, when you start off here, exponential curves are actually weaker. They're less impactful at the beginning. And they're very easy to ignore. Because they seem to be, well, it, it, it'll just go away. And the linear effects seem to dominate. The problem is that one. That's where things take off. And depending on who you are, you either view this as a disruptive kick in the stomach or you view it as an opportunity. It's just a question of perspective. See, let me give you an example of a fairly well-to-do company. I know the people in the front row have never even probably heard of this. But for the people in the back, you remember these boxes that you carry around that had this plastic film and you took pictures. They were cat bird seat, in the cat bird seat in the mid-90s. They rocked. They had a cash cow that was come bringing in cash hand over fist. Then this guy had this idea, can I make a box that doesn't put it on plastic film, but actually brings it in, takes digital images? Well, it turns out the pieces of film have about you know, 10 to 50 billion pixels on them. He had 100,000 pixels. It's pretty insignificant. Remember I said the, the curve tends to be a little bit low in the beginning? He presented this to the board of Kodak, because he worked for Kodak. The board laughed. And they said, you've got to be kidding. We're making money hand over fist. Don't distract us. That thing weighs 10 pounds. <laughs> they had the patents. They had the initial idea. They had the researchers. They knew color. They knew pixels. And they died. In the same year, these guys, 13 people, sold for a billion dollars. A recurring theme in this talk is the fact that what you used to need, you don't need now. Because the resources that we have for the young people here are so phenomenal that you don't need 100,000 people to change the world. And now we have all these. The technology that's racing forward now is mind-blowing. So what I, oh, part of what the point is, it used to take a billion dollars to be able to influence a billion people. Now you don't. You need a laptop, the internet, some free software, and coffee. Never underestimate the importance of coffee in great achievement. 
now a kid in Mumbai can teach themselves code, can pull down the best neural net code, TensorFlow, for example. Google runs on TensorFlow. All the stuff we're going to talk about today is TensorFlow. It is free. Every line of code is open source and public. You can read every line. You can copy it down from anywhere on the planet and have access to all the resources that Google has. Wow. Would Kodak have done that? Oh, hell no. So now somebody in Mumbai can pull that down, get a laptop, and build a startup, and build great technology because they had the idea. The tools are available to every one of you. You just need the idea and the gumption to make it happen. You don't need the billion dollars. All the best code libraries are free. Read GitHub. And the classic line, I didn't know I couldn't do it. So I just did. And of course, the courses. We'll talk about that a little bit more. You don't need to go to a great university, no disrespect, <laughs> to figure out how to do this. All the information you need in a large extent is available for free. And the venture of investors are following. So we find ourselves here. Are we any different than that farmer? Trying to anticipate the changes that are pulling out from under our feet. Let's talk a little bit more about the technologies, uh, underpinnings that are changing all of us. There's a couple of technology revolutions that I think are really important that'll help you understand why this is happening now. First, silicon, second, sensing, third, the manufacturing revolution, and lastly, the algorithms. First off, silicon wafers. Now, this is cool to me. I did my doctoral work in designing um, uh, computer chips. They're really cool. They're a lot of fun. They started off with one transistor back in the 1950s. It was big. It was ugly, but it worked. Here's a cross-section of your iPhone microprocessor. This is a couple years old, so it's kind of big. Um, the line you see right there, that's a two micron scale bar, which means the transistors are tiny. Human hair, if you were to pull one from your head, it's about 50 microns. So this is really tiny. This shows you how Moore's law, which is not really a law, but it happens to fit really nicely. Um, obviously, it started with Ren transistors somewhere down there, and it actually keeps going way up there, has continued exponential growth about doubling of the number of transistors on a chip about every 18 months, every two years. It just keeps marching along until you have this picture. This is a cross-section of a transistor. There's a scale bar by there. It's no longer two microns. It's five nanometers. Can anybody tell me what those dots are? atoms. We're now making transistors that have a countable number of silicon atoms in them. This is a 10 nanometer device. So you, silicon is about a, a half a nanometer um, uh, lattice between. So you have about 20 silicon atoms across in a transistor. And this, by the way, is old. This is a two-year-old image. They're now doing not 10 nanometer, but 8 nanometers going into production. We now are manufacturing devices with a countable number of atoms in every part. And it's not just you're making one of them. You've got 10 billion of these, 20, 30 billion of these in every chip. And every chip on that wafer is working at 90, 95% yield capacity. It's phenomenal. And not just because of the size. The amount of energy needed to switch those atoms from one state to another is insignificant which is why every generation of my smartphone works longer and does more. It takes less energy to make each switch. And takes us back to this, of why it's marching along. The co computational capacity is driving this, which is why we have this exponential curve. Because it started off with this idea of I could have an Apple II Plus or an IBM PC. It ended up with a smartphone that I hold in my hand with all the resources of a crazed supercomputer from a decade or two ago. And we don't even think about it. What do we use it for? It's not computing the weather. We use it for Facebook. I send text messages and watch videos of cats. <laughs> the next revolution is the cloud revolution. Because it's not just that I can put 50 billion transistors into my hand. 
I can, I can spin up 10,000 of those boxes with a moment's notice. I have an app on my phone there. We use Amazon Web Services for our company. I have an app there. I could spin up 10 instances of um, high-end computing resources by touching a button on an app on my phone. Within two to three minutes, those resources will be online and doing whatever I want. I pay um, maybe a penny an hour. If I want something really powerful, I'll pay 50 cents an hour. I don't have to build a room or air conditioning, wait six weeks for Dell to show up the boxes, install software. I just press a button and I have the best computing resources on the planet for my hour. And when I'm done, I shut them off. I don't have them sitting around. Somebody else can use them. I don't care. As a startup, as someone with a cool technology idea, I have access to thousands of servers instantly, and I'm done. No cost. I count it in pennies. Next, the revolution is sensing. Sensing doesn't sound very exciting because we do it so effortlessly. We all have our senses. I'm sensing the room and watching all of you. I'm feeling the air. I'm hearing my voice. I'm speaking. We do it all the time. We don't think much about it. But truthfully, most computers sit in warehouses like this. They don't have much to sense. Historically, we've just run accounting numbers and videos through them. They don't do a whole lot of sensing of the world. But that's changing. Part of what we're doing now is we're carrying around the sensors for them. Do you realize that that smartphone you're carrying has 25 sensors on it? And you and everyone else on the planet are scurrying all over the planet, carrying those sensors everywhere? It's almost like this roving hive of ants with sensors marching all over for those computers. They're literally sensing the world through you. And it's not just you, it's your cars. They've got 150 sensors on them, 200, 300. See, what's happening is the amount of devices, and IoT is this, Internet of Things is this really cool topic right now. But IoT is really just another word for a little sensor that's connected to a network. Whether it's the Nest thermostat in your house that's measuring the temperature, or it's the phone that you're holding that's measuring the light and the, uh, your location, these devices are growing. We've already said we're at the point where we're at two, uh, two to three devices for every man, woman, and child on the planet now. We're going to eight and ten devices. I'm going to ask you an interesting question. I've got two hands. I I've got one phone. If there's going to be 10 of these devices for just me, where are they going? Very good. She says accessories. Yes. They're going in surprising places. And I want to spend a few minutes, because we get all excited about the better, faster computer and screen. But that's actually not where the real innovation is happening. And I want to give you a flavor for that. I'm going to start here. A doorknob? Really? Come on, we didn't show up this lecture to talk about doorknobs. Well, maybe we did. It's worked very well as technology goes for the past couple of hundred years. But I stayed in a hotel this morning that had a key card, and I swiped my electronic key card to get in. Why doesn't the door in my house work the same way? You know it will. You have a smartphone. The door recognizes the Bluetooth signature when I walk in and says, um, welcome home, Kevin. Your wife's home, son's home, your daughter just left. You don't think that's going to happen? Every doorknob in the country soon will. Or better yet, little plastic buckets. Seriously? I'm talking about trash cans? Well, some interesting things happen. When they started putting sensors in trash cans, Turns out, as quoted here, they reduced the number of co garbage collecting shifts from 17 down to 3. Turns out most of the garbage they were collecting was empty. And if they measured the garbage level in each trash can, they didn't have to measure them as often, pick them up as often. And the ones that were already full early, they got them early, and they saved 15 trips every week. They saved a million dollars in terms of gas, truck rolls, smog, carbon footprint, and employees. Remember, these are just little plastic buckets. But we put some sensors on them and a little connectivity, and suddenly we dramatically change carbon footprint and the need for services. Or what about your house? As ignominious as it is, it's a pile of sticks, stucco, 
a little concrete, and maybe some paint. Dumb, dead, and simple. Until you add Alexa. But think about it for a moment. You've just brought this massively intelligent uh, conversational resource into your house. And not just one of them. I've got three of them in my house. Well, until yesterday, the cats knocked one of them into the water bowl, and I found Alexa floating in the water bowl. <laughs> um, I'm still hoping it'll dry out. But we watch Jean-Luc Picard in uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and we say, tea, Earl Grey, hot. Well, we don't have the food synthesizers down. But your ability to just call out, hey, Alexa, play some Caravan Palace. I can ask it anything. It's a con I have made my house intelligent. My house becomes conversational. And just with a $29 hockey puck. Same thing goes with delivery services. It's no longer a question of just sending out a delivery service uh, uh, van. The top of the van includes a quadricopter. The driver hops out, delivers a package to you. The quadricopter hops out and delivers across the street. You now play leapfrog back and forth down the street. You've doubled your productivity. With any extra trucks, any extra any truck rolls or carbon footprints? No. Or doctors. This is having a huge effect, and this is the field that I'm working in right now. Take, for example, the question for heartbeat. You go in and you spend your three to four minutes with the doctor, and the doctor says your heart's fine. But he has an idea there's a problem. You have a million heartbeats every week. You can have a cardiolog cardiologist look at all those? No. You are a small device, measures all the heartbeats for the past week, machine learning looks at them and says, there, there, and there. We saw five events. Those events then get handed off to the cardiologist, who then makes the determination that there's a problem. But you've now reduced 196 hours worth of heart information into a quick summary. This changes your ability to look for spurious and unusual events. Or utility meters. No longer do you have to send truck rolls out. Now all that information has gotten wirelessly. Or light bulbs. This is actually a really fun one. Talk about a 100-year-old piece of really mature technology. What could you do for this? Well, when you get rid of the thermal incandescent bulb and change it to LED, LEDs work on 5 volts. I don't have to run a 120-volt cable to it anymore. I can run a fairly thin cable to it. Um, anything run on 5 volts like uh, Ethernet? Oh, yeah. I can put 60 watts down an Ethernet cable. In fact, all of the wireless networks, all of your data networks on this campus all run on Ethernet. Every light bulb suddenly becomes a sensor endpoint, measuring occupancy, temperature, humidity, ambient light. So when the sunlight streams in, the lights dim. When the sunlight goes down behind a cloud, the lights come back up. So now your light bulb, this is called the Trojan horse of the commercial industrial world, when every light bulb becomes a sensor endpoint. It doesn't have to just be sensing. Turns out these things, when they're LEDs, you can switch them pretty fast. What's fiber optics work on? LEDs. It's lasers, but very similar. Now every light bulb actually can emit data encoded on the light. We can only see up to 30 hertz. So you switch the signals at megahertz. You don't actually see it, but your phone does. Now every light bulb actually becomes a wireless transmission. It's called Li-Fi instead of Wi-Fi, a wireless transmission mechanism. So suddenly light bulbs actually become data transmission. Cars, is this even worth me mentioning? We all know what's going on there with autonomous vehicles. There's sensor endpoints as well. Farming. Doesn't seem very exciting. But now every field is measuring hydration at two foot, four foot, and six foot down, as well as salinity. Because of salinity encroachment, salt comes up from the groundwater. Um, uh, pest encroachment, amount of sunlight, amount of uh, uh, herbicide, and amount of insecticide. Fields become instrumented. So. Back to my question. I've only got one hand. I'm going to have one smartphone. Where's the other 50 billion coming from? In fact, the challenge before us is not just to look at uh, doorknobs and trash cans, but for you to look at the things. And I actually point to all of you. Look at the items around you and ask, how would it be different 
we all grew up with light bulbs and uh, uh, doorknobs always just being light bulbs and doorknobs. But who can look at a trash can? Who can look at a car, a plant, a hanger, or a chair and visualize how that would be different? I can't. I'm too inured to having grown up with it. You can look at it different and have an entire new industry follow after you. Let me read this quote because I think it makes that point so well. This is Mark Weiser, who is CTO of Xerox Park. This is the opening lines of his uh, Scientific American article in the 1990s. Uh, I was a visionary. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. All those devices will disappear. If they've done their job right, you won't even notice that little power outlet there. It's everywhere and power is free. You don't know water. You can get water for free. You get salt for free. All these devices will soon just disappear into our lives. I next want to talk about the manufacturing revolution. Doesn't sound exciting in the slightest, I'm sure. But the point is this. All those silicon wafers we talked about are actually made on silicon. Silicon's fairly expensive. They've now developed techniques that allow you to do the same things, not quite the same resolution, but pretty close in paper and plastic. I now can make my devices on roll-to-roll -roll printing. I can, instead of having to use fancy electronics wafer fab, they're now building these devices roll-to-roll -roll, hundreds of yards at a time. You can actually print LEDs, photo detectors on these. So we now have product packaging that has images and video that move on them. Can you imagine boxes, uh, boxes, um, packaging, or Coke cans? This is one of my favorite. Coke cans that have Coke cups that identify when there's a liquid in it, and the images on the side now start doing a happy dance because they have something in it while you're drinking it. This changes the way packaging is done, the way signage is done, the way the world around us does. It's no longer just cars with static paint on them. It's cars with moving images on them. This is happening right now, and it's changing the way things are done. Which leads me to the fun part. If we have all this information in ones and zeros coming off all these devices in every different direction, it's really just numbers. I mentioned the heartbeats. Who's going to look at a million heartbeats? Well, now we have 50 billion of these devices. I'm not looking at all the data. I'll be clear about that. Our problem now is we've come up, had to come up with new words. We now have to talk about yada bytes and bronto bytes worth of data. How are we going to handle this? And this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning is based on a simple concept the idea of something called a neural net. The idea that the neurons in your brain can be modeled fairly effectively, and you can have vicious uh, religious arguments over uh, whether or not this matches a neuron or not, really doesn't matter. The fact is, this happens to look similar to it, and its power is phenomenal. Because that little neuron there, artificial neuron, may look very simple until I stack them together. Just like a single neuron in your brain doesn't do much, but you put a billion of them together all connected, well, suddenly we can write poetry. Poetry? Well, interesting things happen. And I do want to compare against one thing, traditional coding. For the past 50 years, we've done pretty good coming up with if-then statements. If this, then that, else do that. And there's a nice little bit of a Python code there. It's worked really well for us. But we've tried for 50 years to come up with a way to translate machine, uh, human language. You can do that. You can say, this is a noun, this is a verb, and you put them together and you get this type of a sentence. It's like, failed. Failed miserably. Until they started doing things like this. This is an example of how you code a neural network. In this case, they took a neural network, a, a blank, uh, unwritten uh, tabula rasa, a blank sheet, and they introduced it to Tolstoy, character by character, 100 times. And what you can see is pretty pathetic. But you can model this on a human. What does a one-year-old child do 
having heard the mother's and father's language for a year. You get gobbledygook, and you're pretty proud of it. You love hearing them say, mom, or ga, or ook. But after 300 iterations, this neural network starts getting one and two letter words well, right. You may not find it very exciting, but it got on right, it got period uh, quotation mark, um, it got the period and followed by a capital letter, capitalize the I, Okay, yeah, yeah, you're saying, you're so excited about this, yeah, I pity you. <laughs> but after 500 iterations, it's spelling two and three letter words right. After 1,200 iterations, you're getting noun, verb, matching. You're getting uh, the um, paragraph marks and quotation marks are properly matched. Uh, capitalization is right proper matching of quotation marks across long lengths of uh, text, um, but I would be done. And that's proper formation of English. No one told it this. We just gave it examples of Tolstoy over and over again. Does this start to look like humans at three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old, until you get this one at 2,000 iterations? You actually start getting something in the style and tone of Tolstoy which is pretty impressive because it takes humans a while to get that. What's really interesting is if you do this more and more, it actually starts to hallucinate, and that's the word that's used in the field, it actually starts to hallucinate proper Russian names. Makes up new ones. Makes up new grammatical scenarios that work perfectly. Now, obviously something's missing here. The higher level meta understanding, the sentences don't go anywhere. This doesn't make sense like a thousand pages of a uh, high level uh, uh, plot line in Tolstoy. But the trend is clear. One, you can train something with just examples. That's how humans work. And two, you don't have to code this in the same way. This is why Google was so excited about getting all the voice information. Amazon is collecting voice information. They're, why did A Google start off with Gmail? They wanted all those examples of all your emails to be able to get proper um, sentence structure. They didn't explain how English worked. They gave it a trillion emails and said, you figure it out. <laughs> My point is this. The way we train machine learning systems is completely different than the way we coded before. And this is what a neural network looks like. It comes a bunch of inputs, and they all go, in this case, this one is connected to a whole bunch of previous layers, and whenever something lights up, it fires up in a message, and these things all cascade into this one, and these cascade into that, into that. There's no machine, there's no soul here, it's just mathematics. But the mathematics is shockingly powerful. Here's part of my explanation of the change in the way we code, and this is kind of important. It used to say, you take several hundred coders, you give them a little bit of data, put them away for a couple months and say, come back when you figured out some code. Great. And you change your data and they would come back and make changes and make the code bigger and bigger and bigger until it generally got unmanageable. Now you take one coder, some Python and TensorFlow source code, you give it massive amounts of data. And you get a model when you're done. When you change the data, you just add more data. Coding teams are small, the data sets are large, and the results are phenomenal. We'll give some examples of that later. All of this has come together to why now we have machine learning taking over the way it is. We've got cheap computational resources. We've got massive piles of computational resources. The algorithms have gotten where they are, and the amount of data we have is huge. Remember I talked about brontobytes? We thought that was a problem a few minutes ago. Now we're saying <laughs> that's not a problem, that's exactly what we want. Let me give you two examples. The game of Go, I'm not sure if anybody here has ever played the game. Um, it's kind of like chess. If you view, view chess as sort of a single battle, Go is an entire war taking place in an 18 by 19 board. It's a fairly old game, it's one of the oldest. In fact, I, I read an interesting quote where somebody said, the rules of Go are so simple that if we ever meet alien life, we'll probably find that they're playing a game similar. The rules are so simple, it's probably relatively universal. 
The board seemed relatively small, just 19 by 19. There was a lot of freedom in that board. Humans usually take 20 to 30 years to get good at it, but we actually do get pretty good. The problem is this. The very first move, I've got 361 possible moves. Okay. Once I've moved that, I now have 360 possible moves. And then 359, and 358. And this multiplies up a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot. Um, the number of possible moves is 10 to the 170th power. Um, there's only 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. If every atom in the universe had a universe of atoms inside it, you still wouldn't match the number of moves that are available. Clearly, we can't play this game. Oh, we do. Humans somehow have an ability to process this game even though it's massively too complicated for our brains to play. What gives? Our brains seem to have an ability to handle very large uh, 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 spaces of information and still function surprisingly well. Computers, on the other hand, dead fail. You can't compute this. It's too deep, too rich, too long. You can go a couple of levels and you're toast. Humans don't seem to have a problem with that in the slightest. In fact, what was interesting is that, you know, as a human, I can look at this a fairly complicated board, I can look at this and just instantly have a pretty good idea where the next move should be. Computers can't. A couple years ago, the greatest computer scientists were being asked, what do you think compu computers are ever going to match and understand Go? They said, 10 years minimum. Even that, we're not sure if we'll get it. The next month, Google put their article out. They would nailed it. The machine learning algorithms that I showed you for understanding Tolstoy were applied to the same idea here. They took 30 million moves from several uh, hundred thousand human games and they fed it into this over and over and over until it had a pretty rich understanding of what was going on. They beat the rest, uh, by the way, if you have Netflix, or if anybody has Netflix, watch a show called AlphaGo, which is the name of this code beautifully done documentary that explains the process of going through this. They played against the best player in the world. They beat him four out of five games. What was really interesting is there was a move on game three where the computer made a move and everybody, all the experts in the room said, wow, that was wrong. That was so wrong. No human would ever play that. That was, he's lost the game. Uh-uh. It was almost an alien move. No one had ever seen it before, and it won the game. We're starting to see imagination coming out of some of these ideas where we're seeing new solutions, and this is to our advantage. If we can get new innovation and new ideas out of some of these, we can actually take things further. I see AlphaGo not as a revolutionary breakthrough in itself, but rather as a leading edge of an extremely important development. The ability to build systems that can capture intuition and learn to recognize Here's my next one. This came out on Monday. I just put it in at 1 o'clock in the morning on the slide. Um, I don't think I have the ability. Does somebody else have it, or do I do this from the, the keyboard here? Okay, I assume I do it here. I want someone to listen to this. I want you to listen to this and tell me if something's wrong. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Anything odd with that? Which one was human? <laughs> the caller in this case was a computer-generated... Um, uh, and computer algorithm from Google, called Google Viewplex. 
this wasn't just a give me an appointment, oh, okay, you got your appointment. This is an re appointment request with a problem. They wanted 12 o'clock, but it wasn't available. She was offered 12 to 2 or 115, but was able to think back, change the scenario, come back, well, what I really want is 10 to 12. Sure, what's the service? Service? I had to understand service, understood that what that really meant was a haircut, and we just wanted a women's haircut. We also dropped in the, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And the tone on it, it's a little off. I mean, I'm sure you all heard it. It's a little off, but it's damn close. This is something, and I was arguing with uh, Andra a little earlier about, um, the Turing test. The classic Turing test was if you as a human could tell whether the person on the other side was a machine or a human or couldn't tell. We're starting to get to the point where we're passing the Turing test. This is machine learning being applied at a much deeper, richer level. It's not just playing a game. It's now starting to be able to handle simple, you know, three-year-old, five-year-old type problems. But the results are fascinating. So where's the opportunity? This is terrifying, is it not? We've got machines that are taking over what we used to think was our domain. At the very least, I should be able to take care of my own hair appointment. So we're, are we lost? I'm arguing that we are now in a world where we don't really know what's on the outside. And just as we laughed at that 1850 farmer, we're no better off. We're in a world where connections are exponentiating. Our ability to bring in information, I've talked about the 1.5 billion cell phones all over the planet. Well, this connection is allowing us to reach out and communicate and use resources we never had available. For example, the other day, I needed to be able to render an image for a product placement for a product. I didn't have the software to do it. So I put it out on Upwork. I said, here's the CAD files. I need someone to render this. I had offers from all over the planet. I ultimately hired someone in the Ukraine. Cost me 100 bucks, gave me a couple of renderings within a couple hours. It was easy. We now have the connection and capability to use resources and to leverage resources from everywhere. Now, this means we're making use of the 5 billion phones, the 7 billion people, the 20 billion devices, the five to 10 million cell, cell towers, <laughs> 100 billion web clicks per day, lots of transistors, I'm gonna even try and say that, and our connections, which go on every day, all the time, forever. We're in a very different world. People are now starting to argue that we have just created almost an organism, a structure that wraps the world with connectivity, and we are almost computational nodes on this, a hive mind, if you will, where we're wrapping the intelligence of the entire human race together in one large structure, connected structure. We can find out a way to work, get along. It'll all work out fine. But the leverage and the resources that we have available here is changing the way we work, and it's providing opportunity. Take, for example, music. There was a time when if you were an artist and you wanted to sell a song, you had to go through the record label. <laughs> if you wanted to buy music, you had to go to a record store. I know you guys have never heard of albums. You may have seen them in movies. Um, those of us have actually bought albums and CDs. Um, they're little pieces of plastic that had music on them before you had phones. Music was released rarely, maybe once a year from your favorite artist, maybe every couple years. Does that even compute now? When that happened, People said music industry would die. No one would make music anymore if it was gonna be stolen. The music industry was clearly on the verge of death. Really? Where do you get your music from? I get mine from Spotify. I have access to seven billion, or sorry, several million songs. I just, t oh, that sounds interesting, I listen to that. It's instantly available. I get music from YouTube whenever I want it. I get music daily. I don't wait a year for a new artist. They put out their releases as they're editing them. Daily updates on songs as they're being created. Now you get songs from artists weekly. And this is supposed to be the death of the music industry? 
my point is this. What people thought was destroying the system of music turned out to be a revolution. The music industry is more vibrant and stronger and richer than ever. And yet a few minutes ago, we thought of, we heard a computer that was going to just, is this destroying our life when they take over some of our roles? No. This is opportunity for us. We have to have the mindset to see it. Jobs are changing. Skills are changing. Opportunity is changing. Let me jump here. I want to talk about a, a couple of factors here, and then we'll be done. Education. The old model was you went to great universities. Oh, sorry, I'm careful there. Um, I, I've played the game too. I've got five degrees, three masters, a PhD from the best universities. If you can play that card, do it. But you don't have to. And we need to be aware of that. For example, I was handed a resume from my co-founder and CEO for a coder. Looked it up, you know, didn't have the strongest skills, but pretty good. I asked him some questions. He went. And I said, I want you to answer these questions for the interview. He did. Came back and nailed them. I was like, really impressed. It's like, yeah, I want to hire you. When did you finish university? I haven't. I'm first, I'm uh, just starting my sophomore year in college. I'm like, really? It's like, you nailed this TensorFlow question. Well, yeah, I took the Coursera free course um, a little while ago. I went through the tutorials on the TensorFlow website. I taught myself Python. And um, did I do OK? Well, yeah, you didn't, he figured out he didn't have to wait till junior year of college to learn Python. He didn't have to wait till his senior year class to learn how, what machine learning was. He didn't know he had to wait. He just did it. So do you tell that kid in Mumbai that they have to go to an IIT, Indian Institute of Technology, in order to be able to do a great coding? No. All they need is a laptop, some free code off GitHub, and some free courses off Coursera. What is your limitation here? It's not. Get the great education. I'm all for that. But what I'm saying is the competition now is not limited. Whether it's in Rio de Janeiro, whether it's in Moscow, whether it's in uh, Shanghai, or in Alabama. They're not limited by needing a great university in order to compete. They just need gumption. And Stack Overflow, and <laughs> Stack Overflow, in case you haven't ever used it, it's phenomenal. Um, I needed to learn Python three years ago. I hadn't coded in Python before. Um, I went to Stack Overflow. I said, how do you add to an array? Someone showed me some sample code for it. I'm like, OK, I can do that. How do I sort an array? Sample code. How do I do this? Sample code. I went there after 20 or 30 times. I got the feeling for Python. Suddenly, I taught myself, and I could ask richer and more intelligent questions on Stack Overflow. I got all the answers. I didn't need a course. I didn't need a book. I had sample code. And the Google search questions were so good, they always found me the answer. Code development. This works for a lot of different industries right now, where you used to need cube farms filled with thousands of people. Oh, no, you don't. You need a good coffee shop some friends, some free software, and the gumption to make stuff happen. Great startups. Where did all those apps start come from? Were they come from big companies? No, they came from somebody with a good idea. The code's free. The development platforms are better than anything that came from Microsoft or Apple. The free development platforms rock, because they're made by people that use it day in and day out. Manufacturing. We've touched on this a little bit. You used to need a billion dollars to set up a manufacturing line. Not anymore. For $1,000, you can get yourself a good uh, 3D printer and start making new designs. The design software for it, any surprise? Available for free off GitHub. New ideas. Remember I asked you, who's going to come up with the next great idea for I I IoT, Internet of Things? It's somebody like any of you looking at a device you've had all of your life saying, why doesn't this talk? I can't look at it because I've spent 50 years staring at it and say, of course it doesn't talk. It's a lump of metal. You're looking at it and say, oh, that'd be cool. And the bigger idea is the Internet of Ideas. 
the number of people that now can provide those ideas, it's not just the highly paid engineers at IBM who are doing product ideas. It's all of us. And lastly, machine learning. I've said this over and over again. The resources for all the stuff you need is free now. You just need to the, the, the gumption to go and get the courses and figure out how to do it. The opportunities go to those who want to learn, those who want to build, those with <laughs> you need a fast computer, and coffee. Don't forget the coffee. Um, and startups. So here we are. We started off laughing at this poor old farmer from the 1850s who just didn't really know much. We're not much different. We are just as, we have a tidal wave coming at us just like he did. I don't know where it's going, but I can tell you if you're open-minded, there is more opportunity than ever. Are the jobs changing? Yes. 20 years ago, webmaster didn't even exist as a job. Hundreds of thousands of people have that job now. When uh, assistants and secretaries go away because they're taken over by an, uh, AIs, okay, those jobs disappear. But the new ones come into play. I don't even know what they are. 20 years from now, the job you have, I don't even know exists now. But I can tell you in 20 years, there will be places, there will be new work that needs to be done. We just don't have the name for it yet. And I'm hoping that you guys are the ones that actually create those new jobs. So where is technology going? I don't know, but we're at the front of a tidal wave. All right. Um, oh, some people ask what books I like to read and where some of the ideas I get uh, comes from. Uh, these are some fascinating ones. If anybody wants to know more about them, I'd be glad to tell you. And I thank you very much for your time. Take a couple of questions. Um, I begin. I'm old, so uh, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I also spent all my life in Washington, D.C., so I have a focus there. A few weeks ago, there was a very uh, successful uh, computer person who I think was called before Congress and talked about all the information he amassed. I think it was something called Facebook. Yeah. And um, in, in essence, and I, and I overstate, there was some talk that said, don't you understand that, yes, you are technologically fantastic, but that there are human elements that you seem to be missing? And I would at least say, and I, I'm, I'm just asking for your comment, this young man or young woman in Mumbai who learns computer code, lots of us think that there would be some value if they learned more about humanity than merely ones and zeros. And I understand you're talking about mm -hmm. technology, but I, I do think that's something to, I, I ask for your comments on that. I think a grounding, I mean, my, my undergraduate minor was in humanities and I loved it. The stories, I think, invigorate us. Um, India, for example, has some of the richest, oldest stories in the, the history of civilization. Um, and I think in that particular culture, I think they are, uh, there is a deep understanding of the importance of narrative and history and epic. Um, obviously, we cannot lose that. Uh, and the machines will never displace that. The networks and the uh, machine learning that we have right now one of the things I didn't touch on is necessarily backwards looking. If we're training it on existing data, that data is already old. That's not new. So training its ability to actually anticipate and imagine going forward, it's what we did a little bit with the Tolstoy example, but it's still relatively, well, let's say completely um, infantile and naive. Um, computers don't write stories yet, and it's gonna be a long time before they do. Humans are still going to be the story writers. Um, now, 20 to 30 years from now, I don't know. But I absolutely believe we all have to have a, um, a, a rooting, a background, a foundation in our own history or we lose something.
Um, so earlier you talked about new packaging and things like that coming into play, but they use a lot of plastic and, and chemicals and things like that. And these things that you were speaking about uh, seem fun, but they seem extremely trivial. And how is this environmentally sustainable for us living well, on this planet? I think Can you speak on that? I, I, I unquestionably, I think it's a we. I think you can argue for a cataclysm in terms of um, uh, stab stability. Um, I, I can't address that because the, uh, the industries and the executives that drive that packaging is something that I, I don't have the influence to change. Um, I'm merely identifying trends and uh, opportunities of things that will likely happen. I can't argue for whether they're sustainable or ethically good. Um, and that, I think, is an opportunity for young people such as yourselves to change. Uh, to be able to go in there and say, I, this isn't the way we want our world to work. And it's interesting to see a lot of reusability, a lot of people, and what is it, straws. <laughs> this is a humorous one. Why did it take 20 years for us to figure out that straws are probably not a good idea because they're not recyclable? Well, okay, <laughs> What's how, how many more decades will it be before we start figuring out a few other things aren't really necessary? Um, so I, I look at that as young people needing to change that world. I'm just trying to identify the trends that I see coming. I will get to you. Uh, yes, sir. Again, coming from um, uh, the older people's perspective a little bit. I love the split. <coughs> we got the front two rows yeah. and we got the back. And, and <laughs> the old guys back here. Uh, the Internet of Things. Yes. It's, it's wonderful and it's beautiful. Everybody can get every piece of coding information in the world. How can I be secure in the knowledge that if I get one of those electronic uh, doorknobs that somebody else will not be able to find the software to copy that and open my door instead of me. I, I, we live in a world of risk and I do not disagree with that. Um, the older offline world is far simpler and in many ways safer. Um, but we also delude ourselves into that respect as well. I mean I love having a door with a nice big deadbolt on it. But the wall next to it's made of stucco and a gypsum board. And a good shoulder will go right through that with relatively limited effort. But I'm very proud of my door. Um, now, I, I don't want to change your point because electronics allow someone in, you know, wherever, Rio de Janeiro or um, Florida or whatever, to reach through the network and access your door. Um, yes, uh, I don't disagree with that point. It's a different type of crime. Um, but someone still has to walk through the door uh, to in order to make use of it. Um, security is an ongoing problem. Um, it turns out that humans aren't all that good at building secure systems. Um, some of the interesting work that's been done are actually on um, uh, adversarial networks um, with machine learning, where you build a machine uh, learning uh, tool that says, um, your job is to come up with a secure method of, for this network. And then you take up another AI whose job it is to attack that network um, and you just let them run for a while. Um, and they've come up with some uh, shockingly good new security mechanisms that the humans hadn't come up with yet. I, I think my point on that one is we like to view ourselves as the only intelligence on the planet. And this may be upsetting to people. Um, I think we need to rightly understand that there are other intelligence other than human. And that doesn't mean they're good or bad, but they're different. Um, and I think if we recognize that there's other answers to problems, whether they come from a human or an alien intelligence, I don't really care. What I do care about is finding better solutions towards your security problem. I don't think it has to be written by a human to make it secure. Even if we need to use AIs and adversarial networks to come up with the strongest solution that does protect your door, then I'm all for it. Um, but in answer to your question, I just want to be flat out, security is a major issue. Humans have not worked that one out yet. Yes. These guys Hi. have been trying. Oh. I'm right here. <laughs> um, okay, yes. So what are your thoughts on the, basically kind of the controversial side of AI intelligence? Um, so the mainly the people who make the algorithm for AI are white males, mm -hmm. and it's been seen with deep learning because nobody understands what happens during the deep learning and the hidden networks yep. between the input and output. Mm -hmm. Um, that it has been proven that the AI intelligence, it's a lot easier for it to recognize a white male face than mm -hmm. any other demographic. 
and police um, have actually used AI for predictive policing, and it has profiled more lower income air areas and areas with more minority populations, and how it's kind of become like because it can only use the information that it has, and because it's planned or it's made by a certain demographic, like how to combat that with AI intelligence to move on so we don't get stuck like going two steps back socially. You have brought up a very important point, um, and it has to do with bias in terms of how you train these systems. Um, I just, just want to say, like, ma'am, we have uh, two people up here that have been, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it has to do with bias and how we train it. Let me give you an example. Take a young child and bring him up in a small uh, neighborhood with only white people. That person will only identify people as being white, as being comfortable. That is a limited data set for that neural network inside that child. That is their world and that is their biased world. We then take them to the neighborhood across the town where people have a different ethnicity. They're going to look at that as surprising and have difficulty in that world. The same thing happens with machine learning. It is absolutely true that most of the people that are building these data sets happen to be white, they happen to be male, and they're pulling data that happens to be easily available. I completely agree with that, and it is a serious problem because we have networks that are just like that small child brought up in, in uh, what's isolated environments. I don't know how you answer that other than to be aware of your bias and to make sure that you have a balanced representation across uh, data sets. I think that's true of humans as well, though. Um, for children that grow up in an isolated neighborhood, they don't have a representation across the world. That's why we have universities. We bring people together from all over, so they are exposed to different cultures. We have basically found that we have a same problem with machine learning because they're isolated as well. I don't have a good answer other than that I think people in the world are becoming more aware of it. With regard to the policing issues, um, I think the answer there is any technology is a double-edged sword. Um, knives can be used to cut up peaches. They can also be used to hurt humans. Um, you have tools that can be used for good and bad. I think it's up to us to have a set of ethics that surrounds how these tools should be used. I don't agree with how the police are being used at, uh, in this scenario. I've read some of those articles as well, and I cringe. Um, I think there you have to train people to say, I don't think that's a good idea. They, we as a culture have to make those decisions. Have I answered your question? I, I don't, there's no easy answer to that one. Um, but I think being aware of it um, helps us start to defend against it. Okay, thank you. If that's okay, since the, the students get to meet with the speakers this okay. afternoon, we're all that for, the, for this afternoon, if that's okay with you, because to stay on schedule, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have to stop so here. Sure thank you, you very much. All right, we, uh, well, we are getting ready for the next speaker. If uh, you need to take a quick bathroom break, it's on this side. We'll start in uh, no less than five minutes.
Okay, we are about to start. May you please return to your seats. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our third uh, and last speaker for this morning. Uh, her name is Andra Kay. She's the managing director of Silicon Valley Robotics, a nonprofit industry group supporting innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. Ms. Kay is also founder of the Robot Launch Global Startup Competition and a mentor, investor, and advisor to startups, accelerators, and think tanks with a strong interest in commercializing socially positive robotics and artificial intelligence shared on the Robot State site. Ms. K co-founded uh, RoboHub, the global robotics research news site, building on her background in film, television, and media production, internet, and computing technologies with degrees in interaction, communication, and human-robot cultural studies. She also co-founded Robot Garden, a robotics marker, um, makerspace, and teaches interaction design and theory. Ms. K has a particular interest in understanding diversity and representation in robotics and artificial intelligence, and started the Women, Robot in, uh, sorry, the women in Robotics community. She speaks regularly to international audiences on robotics, uh, AI ethics, innovation, commercialization, and interaction. Uh, finally, I was told that she used to play in early Australian punk rock bands, so we may hear about that. Uh, and she will present today on being an older woman in a room full of, full of robots. Thank you, everybody, and it is such a pleasure to be here. We started off with such a big bang, to use geek jokes, <laughs> that it's going to be a very hard job to follow, and I'm only afraid that, to quote T.S. Eliot, which might be a slightly different paradigm, that I might end with the whimper. Now, there have been so many things said. I wish that I had a lot more in the presentation, <laughs> but I already have too much in there. I will just say some questions were raised, and they're questions that I am going to try to answer. Might not be perfect answers, but I certainly believe that we can't just say, well, we're just building the technology, or that the technology is neutral. I think that for everything we build, we must know how to, let's say, design it appropriately. I was going to say find the on-off switch, but that's actually a pretty basic principle. Uh, I was one of the ones that traveled far. You know that lovely image of the Swiss village? I think that was actually where I was yesterday. <laughs> and it was called um, Walsohus Surtig, and it looks exactly like the photo I have on my Instagram, if you doubt me. <laughs> but what I was doing there, just I was part of a multidisciplinary group of people trying to crack the neural code to develop human-level artificial intelligence. And why I joined that group is because from the outset, they said it's not enough for us to bring the best AI theorists or the best neuroscientists, but we must try to bring a group that is going to somehow work together that includes evolutionary biologists and computer scientists and ethicists and anthropologists because, you know, there's not a lot of difference between the behavior of single cell organisms and the behavior of primates and humans at certain levels. And, you know, perhaps if we were able to develop an understanding of intelligence at the level of, say, a worm or a mouse, then we would have solved many of the fundamental problems of the last 50 years. But I've heard a lot of people over the last 50 years saying we're going to crack AI. And I found it very disappointing. Um, in many ways, it's 
it's a whole nother talk. But I was actually going from Switzerland to Australia, where I'm um, part of the International Robotics and Automation Conference, the first time one of the major research conferences has been held in Australia. And it's like, how do I break the trip to just drop into Tucson for a day? Uh -huh, because I almost literally was flying overhead. But I want to start in a slightly different fashion uh, and talk about empathy, which for me is a very active word. Okay. I was um, made to think of a couple of examples. So empathy is not just understanding and sharing feelings. I think it's also the ability to put that into action, to use it to change our frameworks. And we confuse that a lot with sympathy. So we think that empathy is feeling sorrow or pity or fear. That's sympathy. And it's actually very selfish because that only relates to our feelings about a perceived situation. And empathy is a vastly more active and more interesting word because it relates to us trying through some processes to develop a theory of mind, to understand what is happening for another person or being of any kind. So let's talk about AlphaGo and Lisa Doll. For all that those were fantastic achievements, do you think that perhaps Lisa Doll had a cup of coffee during his games? After all, he did five matches. And maybe he actually got up and went to the restroom because of all the coffee. OK. So do you think AlphaGo would do that? At this point, I would say never in a million years. You know, maybe only half a million. Because all of those things that a human does at the same time as playing Go, we can't come anywhere near developing any, whether it's using recursive neural networks, whether it's using the latest quantum computing software, we are nowhere near being able to develop that parallel ability to stand up, to navigate, to walk around, to breathe, to drink, to have a conversation on the way to the restroom and back. So right now, where our artificial intelligence is at is, for all that, there were really exciting new developments. So now, if you are a, how would you say, an expert in the field of Go, you now look at the new moves that AlphaGo developed, and it completely changes how you think about that game. But if you change the size of the board from 19 squares to 18 squares, do you think Lisa Doll would still be the world's best player? Yes. And he would comprehensively beat AlphaGo because that machine would not be able to play. Simply by reducing the number of squares on the board, it would have to re-go all of the training that led it to there. So there's a transferability in human knowledge that no matter how good we're doing some artificial intelligence, we're so far away from doing. So for me, this is the fascinating question, because machines think in a vastly different way to the way that people think. And yet people often think about machines as if they were people. And that's perhaps the key message of the talk. Uh, but let's take a little bit of a road trip to get there, as came up in the introduction. I grew up in a kind of physics family. I used to build the lab equipment, the physics department, my father was an astrophysicist. My mother developed the first computer systems for the university libraries and did the first networking of them. I was the classic geek girl. When this photo was taken, not only could I name all the dinosaurs that existed, and I so relate to the first speaker saying, I was either going to go into paleontology or astrophysics. <laughs> like, what other choices were there? I could also identify every single plane that took off from Christchurch University because I don't know what this means genetically speaking, but my father was a bit of a plane spotter. And he taught me that. I can't anymore. But even at that age, while I was identifying every plane that took off and every dinosaur that ever lived and all of those wonderful things, I couldn't help but wondering why 
I, the older child, the prettier and more intelligent child, <laughs> was the hostess and not the pilot. I have never, ever gotten over that. <laughs> the Model Rocket Club, the same story. I was always the only girl in the room. And my achievements were not measured on a scale of what a wonderful rocket you built, but what a wonderful thing that a girl is building rockets. Now, I was building the best rockets, so again, <laughs> what I wanted to do was to be Valentina Tereshkova, the first female astronaut, and often forgotten these days. I applied to NASA, and for those that have seen the recent history, this was just after the 13 Mercury women had been ditched out of the program, and at the tender age of 10 or 9, I, like Hillary Clinton, received the, I'm sorry, but you know, NASA will not accept you Unless, of course, you happen to be an Air Force test pilot. And they only take men. Which I thought was a kind of dodgy way to get out of saying, I'm sorry, we've changed. We're just not going to have women in the space program. But nonetheless, that was the case. And it had such an impact on me, it made me change what I was going to do. Which, in hindsight, was a bad decision. Because by 1978, the first group of female astronauts was being employed and they were partially based on their scientific training and not on their Air Force top gun status. But this was what I see whenever, and I tell you, if you ever search for women robotics engineers, you'll find the same thing. You will find a lot of male engineers building female robots. This is what we thought women and the space race was. So, another brief digression. And this is really a good time for the road trip because I lived here for a year in 1971 while my father did a sabbatical at Steward Observatory here at University of Tucson. And is there anybody here who remembers Frank Lowe? Scarily, it's, p it's possible that some of you might. Um, and that would be absolutely wonderful. He sadly passed away about nine years ago, but uh, and my father passed away two years ago. And I, it makes me really, really sad because I would have loved to go back to see him at Christmas time and say, hey, Dad, if you Google Stewart Observatory and K, guess who comes up? <laughs> yes. Um, but um, while my father was here, he was involved in the first infrared mapping of Jupiter. And so I spent a lot of time at Kitts Peak and at a lot of the radio telescopes through my childhood. And this was the paper that he published in 1973, or at least one of them. I found it really, really hard to find these records. And it was visualized on the cover of one of the big magazines like Nature or Science as this. We could use all of that data about the electromagnetic spectrum, about the infrared radiation, and we could convert it into a way that made sense to everybody in understanding what was happening in the solar system. And this is the most recent picture of infrared mapping of Jupiter. Just had to throw that one in there. But my life goals, clearly my life goal was to be an astronaut. Why? It wasn't just the great fashion, OK? Uh, but you understand I did have a spacesuit, and I had built myself a console for the, um, a replica console for the Gemini cabin. And I did have a model lunar lander. And somewhere under the house in Australia, we do still have all of the NASA PR from the Apollo missions typewritten <laughs> because my dad was able to be a correspondent there. And we actually came over for one of the launches again, uh, probably 72. But it wasn't just the technology. It was the way we could use that technology to meet alien life and to attempt to communicate with it and understand it. Slight detour. Uh, seeing as NASA didn't want me, I became a little bit anarchic, rebellious, and spent a few years acting and playing music and 
generally being a little bit punk. And then I decided to have a real career because, you know, certainly my parents never really expected me to get a real career after that. And I became a technical trainee for the ABC in the fields of television, film, and radio. And I spent three years learning how to operate everything from the satellite equipment down to the old school physical splices for the film. Um, that was fantastic. We were on the transition from analog to digital, from film to, not just from film to video, but from using digital effects in the studios rather than analog kind of switching. Um, and this was not that long ago. It was in the 80s. But did you notice the similarity between that and mission control? I've had so much trouble explaining how I went from doing film and television to doing robotics to people. But when I look at the photos of what I was working on, it becomes clear to me that what I did was I went for the most creative, advanced technologies. And the key thing was it was creative and it had global scope. Robots were only in the research labs. This was equipment that had impact on the lives of millions and millions of people. Next progression. So I was, then I had children and I did a lot of work building computers, computer networks and getting particularly nonprofit organizations onto the internet because it was clear that that was where you need to be in the future. But oops, I did realize that for all these years, I was the alien because I was the only woman in the room. And this is where the title of my talk was being the old woman in the room. And age for me now is such a blessing because I have experienced several waves of technology hysteria where we've promised all sorts of amazing things and then we've worried that it was going to destroy society. And I've actually seen what happened. And I look back, I, I've been a real student of the history of technologies. And we've had many revolutions. And there are certain common threads in them. But right now, as people, who thinks things are getting better? Okay, let, it's kind of like, who's an optimist and who's a pessimist? But, you know, we've been talking about equality for how long? Since when? You know, anybody want to know which is the first country to give women the vote? No, actually, I was born in New Zealand. <laughs> and it was New Zealand um, over 100 years ago. Do you know what the last country in the world to give women the vote was? Switzerland in the 60s. You know, and I think most of us go, you're kidding. That's not that long ago, okay? But around about then in the 70s, we believed that there had been this wave of codifying gender equality. That meant that all I had to do was study and apply for those jobs and then apply for those promotions. And I would no longer be discriminated against. Well, you know, a strange thing has happened since then. And we have the figures to prove it. Some fields continued to increase their diversity. And some fields actually went backwards. So your peak female computer scientist period was 1970. And since then, the number has gotten less. And you can drill down into that and say, well, there's probably quite a few other factors. But one of the factors is the status of the job. The reason that there was peak women in that field was this was a period when the physical hardware was still considered the harder part. And that being involved in the programming was seen as a little bit of a, an extension of the secretarial pool. You know, women could do all the software. Men were doing the soldering. And as the status of those roles have changed, it's funny because in both law and biology, women have continued to increase their representation. But in computer science, that's gone backwards. And in many areas of finance as well. So I do believe that these are cultural phenomenon. This was 1967. This was 2012. 
and for all that there are a lot of fantastic women in astronomy, in computer science, in robotics, and in AI, you just don't see that many of them. The statistical, it's about 5%. So I am committed to changing that. If I do nothing else with what I do, I'm able to put into, to into play some initiatives that I can speak up about and try to make whatever changes that I can. And if we want to talk more about this at another time, it's not just one thing that you have to do to change things. You have to change the whole process from advertising through to promotion and assessment. You have to change language. You have to change a lot of underlying assumptions, but you can do this. It's just you can't just fix one thing. And perhaps the key question to say here is that what makes us think that this is a woman's problem? Okay? This is a problem for all of us because we simply do not have enough intelligent people doing creative things with technology. And we need that for the world to progress. So this was my life goal. It became building the alien, not going into space to find it because I realized that alien was a concept that we already had on Earth and that we were now starting to be able to do technologically. As you see, RoboNaut and real astronaut. RoboNaut is better equipped to work in space because space is a very dangerous environment and the radiation is certainly among many other things, i.e. sudden death from decompression, extreme cold, but you know, particularly the radiation means that even if you solve all the other things, we haven't really worked out how people can stay in space for very long. But we're building these robots and you say, I don't know that I've really seen them. And why am I interested in robotics now? Because now we've had 50 years of robots in the factories and they've been behind fences. They've been doing dirty, dull and dangerous jobs and that's over. We now have collaborative robotics that through a combination of sensors and actuation are able to do things like back drivable joints, um, things like smaller and lighter robots so that you simply don't have to deal with the inertia, with the inertial mass. We have collaborative robots is, is what this new trend is called. We also have affordable robots and we have social robots. And the reason we have these is because they're becoming affordable. And I'm going to go really quickly through this because we've already heard a little bit about this phenomenon of the democratization of technology where you start with a $1.4 billion autonomous vehicle, the Cassini spacecraft, and then you have, oh, you know, 12 million per Predator drone, and then you get down to, they're at Costco. Everybody has them under the Christmas tree. You get an autonomous drone for two, $300, to the point where you get these tiny little drones, which are still maybe remote operated right now in the mall, but in the research labs are capable of autonomous operation, down to the size of one centimeter. So we go from this picture, and this is an Australian robot, a fully self-driving truck, and Australia's had these for 15 plus years, maybe 20, to these. And this is a robot truck that you might see on the roads in states around you, Utah, Nevada, definitely Florida. Just, you know, FYI, if you're saying, hold on, they're testing self-driving vehicles everywhere. Where don't I go for a holiday? Okay? Florida's not such a great place right now. <laughs> and it's really interesting ethical decisions around this self-driving vehicle space because on the one hand, these are really needed commercially speaking. You say, well, what about all those poor truck drivers? Do you know the greatest job vacancy right now is long distance truck driving because it is such a dangerous, dull job. So every click on buy it now that we do on Amazon, we kind of put one of these into play. So maybe we need ways to save energy, ways to make it a more um, efficient process, practice. But then, here's the flip argument. If something goes wrong with that, do I want to be on the same road? 80 miles an hour? 80 tons? 
Yep, no. I like Waymo a lot better. But, you know, we've got these battles right now about do we create dedicated lanes on the highways? How do we, how do we slowly guide self-driving vehicles in, in with human drivers? Because human drivers think very differently to self-driving cars. And arguably, some of the complex environments for these vehicles, the city streets, where everything is chaotic. You know, if you look at it as an engineer, you'd say, put them on the highways, you can have dedicated lanes, and we're already pretty much doing that with kind of lane assist and cruise control. But if you look about it in terms of, well, what's the worst that would happen in a crash? Then you think maybe putting them into those can't go faster than 25 miles an hour scenarios, even if it's a far more chaotic environment, makes more sense. So one of the key things in this ethical battle is right now there have been two, maybe a few more if you count China, fatalities, three, in self-driving vehicles that I know of right now. Yet there have been two dozen fatalities in the last two years from carbon monoxide overdose from people with automatic door openers for their cars. That's an autonomous system killing us. But it doesn't strike the same level of fear or terror. I don't know why. But that's really at the heart of our ethics and all of those silly trolley problems, which, you know, I think ethics is great, but trolley problems don't help anything, where you have to weigh up what are the values of these technologies compared to what are the costs. In general, driving is getting safer and safer. It's the devil in the details. So you may have seen this self-driving technology. There are now so many of these in the Silicon Va Valley area that San Francisco has, go has gone for a ban on sidewalk delivery robots. But the um, startups just said, that's fine, we'll go to Redwood City. So talking about robots. The first thing we think of when we talk about robots is that we think about humanoids. And if you know the Gartner hype cycle, to me they are at the peak of the overinflated expectation. Where we are, in general, we've already got mass automation. We're starting to get teleoperation of manipulation and some mobility. But these have to be quite simple systems because this is what the most sophisticated humanoids in the world look like. And this is from the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. And this is actually the most widely viewed video from any of the DARPA projects. So, you know, definitely compared to, say, the winning <laughs> robot. <laughs> and it's the best PR move they ever made. Now, have any of you seen the fantastic videos of Boston Dynamics robots doing backflips? Right, um, that's one of them. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it does amazing backflips in the video carefully curated and controlled. This was in the wild. Now, admittedly, they have improved the robot since then, but the Atlas from Boston Dynamics was the base robot platform for this challenge. And the two winning teams did not use that platform they did not use that platform either. That was a very disappointing Japanese robot. But you know, the whole reason for this challenge, it wasn't to build humanoids, it was to build robots that would be capable of solving disaster situations. This was modeled on the Fukushima nuclear reactor shutdown procedures. 24 hours could have prevented the nuclear disaster. But it was so dangerous that nobody could get in there. And everybody said, Japan, where are the robots? Well, they're still not there, <laughs> okay? Where we are right now is what is called a Cambrian explosion of robotics, but they're far less sophisticated. Some of them are as kind of simple as snake robots, or they're robots with wheels, or they're robot arms, but it's very rare that they're put together. It's really about specialization in one physical form or another. So I, did I mention that there are 50 self-driving companies testing in California right now? Okay, 
one of them is doing a self-driving grocery cart. Some of the other examples that I'm just checking how I'm going for time because there's so much I want to say and I can get really stuck on some of these examples. That one is cute. What I love is that for each of the photos that I show you, there are a half a dozen others. And I had to hold myself back from being repetitive. So these are some of the earliest models of autonomous delivery. They're not good, okay? It was great advertising for Domino's, I'll have to say, but it's a little bit, the technology was not really there yet. The technology is, just a few years later, rolling out, and while Delivery is not the right thing to do with drones of this size. These drones can be really, really good at conducting inventory and doing surveys, particularly in a warehouse type environment. Where, but did you know 60% of all warehouses still use paper documentation for their inventory? Okay, but we're getting to the point now where we're going to put codes in or on everything, whether it's a a barcode, a QR code, or an RFID tag. Amazon has patented an idea of doing drone delivery with giant blimps. In fact, they've patented a lot of ideas like that. And you go, well, it's, it's speculative. All of the big five are patenting a lot of very speculative moonshots. But I'm not going to show it. I'm working with two startups that are doing large-scale drone delivery right now. And what I like is, and this has just come out in the last year, Kiwi robots were pretty poor features until they got their funding. This is a Berkeley University startup. And after their last round of funding, just a couple of months ago, they've released this prototype. They now have three different sorts of autonomous robots that are able, in each case, to work with a different situation. And therefore, together, they have become far more economically feasible. They're starting to provide potentially a value for a restaurant, and it's not simply a publicity exercise. Although that's right. Yes, that's publicity. <laughs> it's gotten to the point now. Do you remember when robot vacuum cleaners and iRobot was pretty much, they were the robot vacuum cleaner maker, and then a few more companies started making them? Well, robot vacuum cleaners are now 25% of the global vacuum cleaner market, which means that every major consumer electronics company has a line of robot vacuum cleaners. That's what's important about this. Not the robot per se, but the fact that this is what LG unveiled at CES this year. Every major consumer electronics manufacturer is now putting their bets on their line of service robots, home robots, and robots that we call them service robots because you might not own it, but you will pay it for the services that it does you as it's collecting your luggage or doing your grocery to the car delivery or all of the other tasks that these robots are being designed to do. And indeed, this is part of a line of robots that LG has which, to my mind, really quite center around the smart hub, the social robot hub. And to me, I call Amazon Alexa and Google Home robots. They're at the less featured end of the spectrum, all the way up to mobile home robots with faces and more features. Uh, so you see commercial delivery robots mainly doing inventory management, mobile manipulators, they're not even over the peak of uh, hype yet. Basically, it's like the old engineering joke, you know? Do you want fast, cheap, or good? Pick two. I would even argue, if you're looking at robots, pick one. You know, you can do mobility, or you can do manipulation. Don't combine those things. So, this could just be a mistake, or it could be a video that's not playing. It's probably a mistake. Uh, what you're seeing in the last three years is the development of a range of robots for logistics. You might not see those directly, but almost all warehouses now have them. It's taken about five years since Kiva Systems was bought by Amazon, but now every major retailer is buying a 
company to do this kind of back-end logistics. And you may have heard Walmart is rolling out 50 of these robots for their stores. What you didn't realize is that there are five or six other companies that are being rolled out in all of the other major retailers. And these are robots that you will see as you go up and down the aisle doing your shopping. They could work at night, but they also work at day so that they don't have to deal with um, getting in the way. Actually, it's not so much about understanding the images that they're collecting for inventory. Uh, you could design them to do that at night, but at night you put the stock restocking on, and that's actually harder for a robot to navigate around. And some people will say, wow, they're just starting with inventory. Soon they're going to be stocking the shelves. But they're not, because robots do inventory 10 times better than people. Even people with RFID scanners and cameras going up and down the aisles. People get bored and people get distracted. The results here are 40% more accurate. So you can imagine the amount of shrinkage and restocking this allows each retailer to do, and they're all fighting for low margin in work. So you don't say that the robot is taking a job. You say that these robots are now allowing retailers to remain competitive in their pricing and to keep their stores open. And you don't put an arm on that robot so it can stock shelves, because it's going to do it at half the pace of a minimum wage person. And it's not going to do it as well. So I see this as an ongoing split between the robots taking tasks, not jobs, and we just have to work out, here's the task that the robot does well, and then here are all the rest of the things that constitute the job that is still going to be there. So voice interaction is really where robotics technology is at right now, and that doesn't necessarily mean voice interaction with a head attached to it. It's actually voice interaction on the smartphone or the Alexa or some other comparatively dumb-looking device. And it needs to be a dumb-looking device or we expect it to behave better. So this is a kind of idea of the spectrum of social robots. And it's proven over and over again that if the robot looks like that and it can't help you, that's fine. If the robot looks like that and says something that's garbage, then <laughs> it's not good enough at all. Now, oh, that's why that slide's there. So robots that look or act like humans peak of hype, overinflated expectations. Robots that look like prehistoric life, like snakes and insects, totally underrated for their utility value. They're going to be awesome. And where the sophistication is happening right now, voice interaction. And we are going to be rolling out voice interaction in all sorts of embodied robots. Yes. Someone raised the issue of encoded bias. Well, to me, this is the nightmare scenario because we've developed we have biased data. We then encode that biased data into algorithms. And it's starting to come out in our voice assistants. Has anyone noticed? I mean, this is the image of Cortana, the Microsoft voice assistant, that Cortana was modeled on. Now, we does anybody have a voice assistant that's male? Where did you get it? How did you tune it? Right, customized, okay? No, never by default. Not only that, but here's the scary part. It isn't just that we're getting female voice assistants by default. This is what they learn by machine learning because Amazon's Alexa did not have a default female voice. It went through a learning process to develop a voice and it developed a female voice, okay? so. There is a feedback loop that's happening here. And when we embody this, you take your female voice, and of course it goes into a female body, 
And psychologically, we have a lot of evidence that we respond to a female voice in roles of assistance, being helpful. And we actually respond to a male voice in roles of authority or command. So I was in London recently, and it might not be like this all the time, but I wish I had made a voice recording because there was a female voice saying, we're now approaching Hampstead Heath. The next station is going to be something else that I can't remember. And then the male voice would say, mind the gap. <laughs> so you understand that most of these commercial robots are being driven by commercial operations who understand these effects really well. They're not going to try anything tricky or new with us. They are simply going to do what they know works. In terms of design principles, I love this because, you know what, we laugh at C-3PO because it tries so hard to be human and it fails miserably all the time. And that's really, really funny. Whereas R2-D2, who beeps and twirls and has very few human features, is very silly and yet always exceeds our expectations. And we find that very humorous as well. So animators have understood how we interact with artificial creatures for a very long time. And in fact, the Disney animators developed uh, the key principles, the 12 principles of life that are used when you design robots, which are a lot of fun if you go look for that. So animators and artists are actually behind the design of the best robot systems. So there's another little film and television meets robots twist. But these days, it's very simple to build robots. And even a simple robot is going to trigger an emotional impact. All you need to do is put two eyes on a rock or a cookie, and it suddenly has an expression, an emotion. So my five laws of robotics to compete with Asimov. Um, but I will say that these are actually design guidelines or ethical principles that have come from the EPSRC workshops over the last six years, mainly in the UK, but it's a collection of some of the best minds in this. Well, what I've done is I've kind of shortened the somewhat academic rules and tried to make them understandable to engineers <laughs> or investors. So forgive me if they seem a little simple for everyone here. Rule number one. Yeah. Let's not go there. And indeed, you know, there are military systems that are being designed that have no other purpose, but most robotic systems are multi-purposed. Second law. Robots should obey the law. Well, there were no traffic laws that could deal with the influx of automobiles in the 20s and 30s. I think it wasn't until sometime in the 20s when the first traffic light intersection was developed. So you did have to create a new set of interactions and rules, and an entire class of jobs came out of this. Traffic police, parking restrictions, street design, not to mention mechanics and garages and fuel uh, pump attendants and all of those kind of things. But at the same time, we exist already in a legal framework that is somewhat loose so that the judicial people, people, <laughs> the, judi the judiciary can actually make interpretive decisions based on case law and various interpretations. Now, it happens that there is a whole class of law that applies to devices and products, tort law, for example. But there are also broader laws like privacy law, maybe not so much in the US, but definitely strongly in Europe. And so we have a lot of cultural fears about all those eyes in the sky with drones. But the reality is, if they're recording, they're breaking the law. Now, I'll tell you where this gets tricky. And it isn't so much the spread of drone technology. It's actually the fact that all of those voice assistants 
they have to be on all the time to be able to respond to your voice. And if you look at autonomous self-driving vehicles, every sensor that they need, fundamentally need for navigation, is always on, recording everything. Way back when I was still in Australia, there was a bit of a fuss because we discovered that Google was what you call war driving. When they were doing Street View, they were driving around the streets and they were writing, they were logging everybody's Wi-Fi and whether it was secured or not and all of that kind of information, which you think, hold on, that's inside my property line. You can't do that. Well, legally you couldn't, but they did it anyway because nobody could tell until somebody did. Okay? But this is where I'm saying, this is an overlooked law of robotics because there are laws. And if your technology is, by default, going to be breaking them, then I think you need to be working fairly hard on designing better and being transparent about it, but that's the next law. This one, again, this worries me more than encoded algorithm bias because although I don't believe necessarily that software is always easy to update, it is a lot easier than a physical product recall. So if your physical robots are doing the wrong thing, and it might be as simple as wearing out quickly, that maybe it's a really critical part of the robot system that wears out, and then it is dangerous. There are all of these potential issues. And I work with a lot of companies that are less than three years old. They simply have not had time to do the level of quality testing that we'd like. Oh, crikey, my timer stopped and I didn't know. We think of robots like that, but really, this is what they look like, or this. And it's a lot harder to recall those physical devices. Finally, this law, robots must not mislead us. With robot traffic increasing, we're going to get robot smog. With robot salespeople, with social robots, we're going to get robot spam. And as I touched on before, we're going to get robot stereotypes. Finally, this is perhaps the most important rule of all. Robots should be transparent and robots should be identifiable. So that's an extension of transparency. Not only should we be able to unpack what's happening in the black box of the systems and all of those systems that are being off the shelf put together, like, well, I was just using OpenCV, so I guess it didn't recognize women's faces because it's not that good yet, but it wasn't my problem. I just bought it and used it, etc. Those systems to the systems that we honestly don't know what's happening when they're all working together, to the fact that we don't really have a law saying, unlike cars or boats, it must be identifiable. There really are no labels on those robots, which I think poses some rather interesting ethical questions. And I think that this should be one of the fundamental rules that we ask for straight off. Robots should be identifiable. And now I have lots of really exciting videos of new robots that I don't have time to show you, but you have heard probably of YouTube. But I will finish with one in the background. Super cool, that was Alison Okamura. This is Space Robotics New Systems. But I believe that you might even see this in person because this is Arizona University and I believe this is being tested somewhere not too far away from here. But there are very novel models of construction happening now to allow robots like this to be built for about $70. They're, being, they're using a lot of simulation to do evolutionary design, like biomimicry is a fascinating field of robotics. Not just simulation in computer or virtually, but with sand pits to test, to get some real kind of answers going against the evolutionary process to say, what do these forms work? Now, interestingly enough, the closer to nature the shape you construct is, the more likely it is to be successful. So I think um, you'll find that life is influencing the design of robots everywhere, but we have to move past the electromechanical systems, which are inherently different in how they're designed. And we're starting to see soft robotics, bendable robotics, cheap robotics, inflatable robotics, um, 
you might have seen my favorite robot documentary, Big Hero 6. Okay, this is modeled on real life research robots, which I can't show you yet, but Andrew Ng says that AI is the new electricity. It isn't, because without those robots to become the data collection, uh, Derek, the devices by which we develop the AI, the devices by which we capture the data, then I don't believe we're able to have the impact on the world that we want from something as fundamentally game-changing as what we're doing in AI. So robots can change the world for the better, and we need them to because we need to solve things like food security. We need to solve things like aging population, and we can make better environmental choices if we have more efficient processes that require less input and less output. So ultimately, I think we need to change our physical world infrastructure that has to involve robotic systems. And just to finish off there, where I came from the start is I believe that being an older, these days, woman in robotics gives me a perspective that I don't really see that often in the room. And I truthfully believe that if there were more diversity in the room, then we would be designing these new and different systems of robots faster. We need to maximize the innovation potential in our society, not simply keep going down the same path that the homogenous group says is the path to follow. So we need people who are willing to challenge the stereotypes and I think if you come from a diverse perspective to start off with then you're much much more advanced in terms of being able to create more interesting and more socially useful technology thank you so. okay thank you very much we are running a little behind with the program because the students have to go uh, somewhere else after that. So, but we'll we'll still be able to take a, a couple of questions at least uh, for the presentation. Ah, cool. And I'm very happy to answer questions online in in other fashions. So I'm I'm sure my email can be made available. Okay. I just want to say I'm currently studying uh, chemical engineering at ASU. Um, with a focus in K through 12 STEM education with the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. I've got to ask this question to a lot of uh, professors and engineers, but I've never gotten to ask an actual woman engineer. So, so I wanted to ask, what does the idea of diversity in STEM mean to you? And how can we get more students of diverse backgrounds to pursue STEM? Okay, pay them and promote them. We fix those two things, we fix everything. I think a lot of people think that because there are no women in engineering, women need to get the message back in kindergarten that engineering is a good idea. I will speak for the fact that I thought it was a fantastic idea until I discovered that I wasn't welcome and that my contributions would c perpetually be undervalued and that I would not be paid at the same rate and that I would not be promoted. And I think what we see is not a lack of women going into STEM, but we want smart women in STEM. And smart women notice the fact that nobody else is in there. You know, we need to change that. And I think we need to start at the top. We need to have more heads of departments who are women. We need to have more CEOs who are women. We need to have more investors who are women. And we need them to have the same pay scale as we've just seen in Hollywood, where, well, that's just the way it is. Women get paid less than a tenth of their males, male par partners. Hi. Um, I just want to bring in the second rule that you mentioned, and you said that robots, robots must obey laws. And so I was wondering, what does that mean for the legal responsibility of companies? And do you think changes have to be made to pre-existing legal systems? Or do you think that we should just interpret laws differently to apply to robotics? Yeah, there is a nice amount of employment for legal scholars who are already discussing things like what are the nuances around self-driving trucks and cars, for example. That's been going on for 
10 years. Um, yet some of the best legal scholars, look at the work of Ryan Kahlo and Bryant Walker-Smith and Kate Darling and a couple of others uh, whose names escape me right now, but they're saying the framework exists. And where is the incentive to develop the applications of this? Actually in the insurance industry. And you can guarantee that they are working on it. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna have to, to stop here. Thank you so much again. The, the talk will resume tomorrow morning right here for the second part. We have three additional speakers. You have the flyers out there if you would like to grab one. Nine, nine o'clock tomorrow morning will resume over here. And for the students, uh, is somebody taking them for lunch or how? Well, okay, so you go with Jim. He's gonna, and then for the, um, for the, the speakers and others will be, uh, who can follow me. <laughs> Thank you again.